morning. I am Joy Cheney, Executive Director of the Washington Bureau and the Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at the National Urban League. And I want to welcome everyone to day two of our 19th Annual Legislative Policy Conference presented by Johnson & Johnson. The conference got off to an exciting start yesterday with several important and insightful policy discussions. I hope you'll watch the video of it later. There's much more in store for you today as the National Urban League continues fighting for you and for all of us. Now, please join me in welcoming the head of the Urban League movement, our president and CEO, Mark H. Morial. Thank you, Joy. And yes, here I am, Mark Morial, president and CEO of the National Urban League. Welcome back to day number two of our legislative policy conference. Great to see you. Of course, if you missed yesterday, don't worry. You've got access to both days online at NUL.org. And you can also always follow us across all social media channels at Nat Urban League. Let me recap the highlights. We discussed the implications for Black Americans in the 2022 elections. Social determinants of health and how to expand opportunities for home ownership and affordable housing in communities of color across the nation. We also have congressional champion awards that we delivered to Senate Majority Leader Schumer and Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And EPA Administrator Michael Regan came and shared some thoughts with us. All in all, we had a day of essential ideas and activism and today, we even have more. Speaking of activism, I want everyone to participate in today's Phone to Action initiative. In far too many states, a person can be discriminated against at work, in schools, and in public spaces on the basis of their hairstyle. We need federal legislation that protects the right to wear natural or protective hairstyles and makes hair discrimination illegal. The United States House of Representatives has already passed anti-hair discrimination bills, twice already. Tell the United States Senate it's time to hashtag protect the Crown Act. Text number 52886 with the keyword protect the crown. Again, let me give it to you. Text number 52. 886 with the keyword in the message, protect the crown. Now, before we transition to our first of today's panel discussions, please stand by for a message from our presenting sponsor, Johnson & Johnson. Hello, my name is Vanessa Broadhurst and I'm the Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Johnson & Johnson. As a longtime partner of the National Urban League, we're thrilled and humbled by the opportunity to once again support your annual legislative conference and to take part in the conversations around pressing healthcare policy challenges and their solutions. Unfortunately, we're well aware that the U.S. healthcare system still contains health inequities. The facts show access to quality healthcare often comes down to the color of your skin, making racism a public health crisis. In 2020, we announced our Race to Health Equity, a commitment to partner with community leaders and key stakeholders to reduce health inequities for people of color. So far, we're proud to say that we've invested in efforts across the country which improve maternal health outcomes, support frontline healthcare workers, and address overall health inequity. Of course, there's more we can do. And that's why we're looking forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson & Johnson. And thank you to each and every one of our sponsors. Our supporting sponsors include the Anti-Defamation League, Comcast, DoorDash, Lyft, National Grid, T-Mobile, Biasat, Verizon, Walmart, Wells Fargo, 
let me say thank you to each and every one of our sponsors. Now, as we transition into today's first panel discussion, please take a look at this message from one of our supporting sponsors and great allies in the collective fight for equity and justice, the Anti-Defamation League. Hi, I'm Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO and National Director of the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL. Like the National Urban League, ADL is a legacy organization fighting hate. For over a hundred years, our mission has been to, quote, stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. Over the last number of years, ADL and the National Urban League have partnered on election protection and voting rights work. And we've created spaces for frank conversations about the persistent inequities in our society, particularly as COVID-19 exacerbated economic inequities and unequal access to education and health care for some of our most vulnerable communities in the country. I am so proud of the work that ADL and the National Urban League have done together. I am grateful for my friendship with your CEO, the very gifted Mark Morial, who has been a mentor and a colleague to me to the collaboration of our staff on the ground in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., and across the country, and perhaps most excitedly, to the partnership that we forged between the young leaders in both of our organizations. In March, we harnessed this power in pursuit of a, criti a critical set of policy changes by joining together to submit testimony to a congressional committee that was investigating the recent wave of bomb threats targeting HBCUs. We told the committees about our shared histories of suffering threats, intimidation, and violence. And arguably, there are no two communities in this country who are more familiar with such threats than the African American and Jewish American communities. We know what it's like to have our houses of worship targeted. We know what it's like to have our edu educational institutions targeted. We know what it's like when extremists and terrorists attempt to marginalize and victimize us. And then we came together again to call for significant policy objectives, including increasing funding for DHS's nonprofit security grants program appropriating 15 million new dollars for grant programs that would allow us to implement the national incident-based reporting system, to create state-run hate crimes reporting hotlines, and to conduct critical training and develop protocols for identifying, analyzing, investigating, and reporting hate crimes. And finally, urging members of Congress to evaluate how to make hate crimes reporting mandatory by all law enforcement agencies across the country. Because still today, despite the rise in hate crimes, far too few agencies actively report such incidents, and that must change. As our policy agendas increasingly overlap, I am really optimistic that there will be more opportunities to raise our voices together in advocacy and to demonstrate to elected officials at all levels of government from both sides of the aisle that the African American and Jewish American communities stand together, united in fighting against extremism and hate of all kinds, that we both are opposed to anti-black racism, ugly anti-Semitism, and all forms of bigotry and intolerance, and that we are working together to create better and safer futures for our respective communities. We at ADL are so grateful for our partnership and we wish you all the success in the world to make this policy conference a huge hit. We look forward to continuing to expand our work in service of our shared missions. And again, wishing you all blessings and peace this year. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome again to day two of Urban League Fights for You, our 2022 Virtual Legislative Policy Conference. I'm Sadiqa Reynolds, President and CEO of the Louisville Urban League, and it's my pleasure to serve as your moderator for this session. From advocacy to equity, is it time to rethink activism to achieve our goals? They say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Two years ago, we witnessed the massive protest and calls for a racial reckoning in response to George Floyd's murder. Yet in 2022, the forces of injustice and inequality are on the offensive. Democracy is in the crosshairs. Even our history is being erased from America's classrooms. All these developments beg the question, are the tried and true civil rights tactics enough? We'll explore the issue in depth with an outstanding panel in just a moment. First, a brief word from our supporting sponsor, our good friends at T-Mobile. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Clint Odom, Vice President of Strategic Alliances and External Affairs at T-Mobile. And as many of you know, I'm an alum of the National Urban League. and I'm broadcasting to you today live from Bellevue, Washington, the headquarters of T-Mobile. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I want to talk to you about the road from advocacy to equity. Now, more than ever, we hear about corporate social responsibility. And according to the consulting firm McKinsey and Company, from the date of George Floyd's murder and the six months that followed, roughly one third of the Fortune 1000 made public statements on the importance of racial equality. Of those, 93 followed up with a commitment, either internally or externally, and 57% publicly announced the amount they were committing to racial equity initiatives. So that brings us down closer to one in six. Together, those companies pledged $66 billion, and that's a great thing, but money and promises aren't enough, and they aren't real change. Black and brown Americans continue to face marked economic inequality and inequity. If corporate social responsibility is to mean anything, businesses have to embrace the decision-making process that considers the action of that business on the communities, the workers, and the environment. And the funny thing is, cultivating a responsible culture isn't just the right thing to do. It also makes financial sense. Customers and talent alike see themselves represented in the workforce, driving sales and bringing the best talent to your business. Corporate social responsibility has become a best practice, and it's a liability not to consider its impact. That's not to say there isn't a role for policy reform. Policy is very important, but given that government and interventions and policy changes have limited success, we have to look to other tools. And those tools have to drive equity. So it really does take a two-pronged approach with corporations doing their part, using their economic power, power that they gained in part from black and brown consumers. Corporations have an opportunity and a responsibility to step in and fill the gap. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, T-Mobile, for your support and partnership. Next, we have a special presentation of one of the National Urban League 2022 Congressional Champion Awards. To do the honors, I am happy to welcome once again the President and CEO of the National Urban League, Mark H. Morial. Thank you, Sadiqa. And hello to each and every one of you. As Sadiqa mentioned earlier, the subject of this session, activism, to equity speaks to the challenging realities of advancing social justice in 2022. For African-Americans, activism, no, it is not a choice. It's a necessity. It's survival and thrival. And no one knows that better than our next Congressional Champion Award recipient, a good friend and a lady from the great state of Alabama, Congresswoman Terry A. Sewell. Raised in the historic civil rights battleground of Selma, a community she now represents as the first black woman elected to Congress from her state. Her passion, 
her determination, and the way in which she honors her constituents and her predecessors in the struggle for equity have caught our eye. Specifically, she's picked up the mantle of voting rights from the late Congressman John Lewis, taking the lead in what I believe is America's defining moral battle of our time. Terry Sewell is the author and lead sponsor of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which would restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. Let me say that again, gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. History will remember the Senate's inability to pass this legislation earlier this year as a shameful failure of conscience. But our honoree fights on, as she herself has said, we pick ourselves up and continue this fight. Our democracy is too important and it's at stake. As a true champion, I am proud to present the National Urban League 2022 Congressional Champion Award to Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to every member of the National Urban League for this prestigious honor. You know, I am honored every day to represent the historic cities of Birmingham, Montgomery, and my hometown of Selma, Alabama. And it's on behalf of the 750,000 constituents of mine that I happily and so proudly accept this award. As a native of Selma, I know that it's my responsibility to honor that legacy by continuing to preserve and advance the progress of those who dreamed of a better life and were willing to risk everything to realize it. After all, it was in Selma where foot soldiers like my dear friend and mentor, the late Congressman John Lewis shed blood on that bridge for the right of all of us to vote. Though I am so grateful for your recognition, I want to use this opportunity to remind you that our work is not done. Indeed, old battles have become new again as we face the most concerted effort to restrict the right to vote in a generation. At the same time, we're up against a Supreme Court that is hell bent on destroying our nation's most consequential civil rights law, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In Congress, I'm proud to lead the fight to protect the sacred right to vote. As the author and lead sponsor of H.R. 4, the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, this critical bill would restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and would bring back federal oversight for the most egregious state actors. H.R. 4 passed the House of Representatives in August, but it failed in the Senate due to an archaic procedural rule that requires 60 votes. The failure of this bill in the Senate was devastating, but I assure you that it was merely a roadblock. It is not the end of the road. I submit to you that we can be disappointed. We can be frustrated. We can be downright mad, but what we can never do is be deterred. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. I want to thank you again for your recognition. Please know that I will continue to move forward with the help of the National Urban League to ensure that we all have that sacred right to vote. As long as I have breath in my body, I will continue to fight for that sacred right. Together, let's get into some good trouble. Thank you, Congresswoman. Picking up on Representative Sewell's inspiring and powerful message, the National Urban League would like to share a few words and images documenting our ongoing commitment to civic engagement nationwide. Let me please introduce Jerrica Richardson, the National Urban League Senior Vice President for Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives to explain more. Thank you, Sadiqwa. As the National Urban League continues to provide direct services in the more than 90 communities we serve across the country, we also have a duty to advocate for those communities. In 2020, the League launched its Reclaim Your Vote campaign, the largest civic engagement campaign in the organization's history. There had not been a civic engagement initiative at such a scale since 1974, when then 
National Urban League president, Vernon Jordan, instituted a national voter registration program. The breadth of our work in 2020 and 2021 covered on the ground canvassing, texting, phone banking, voter registration, civic advocacy around community policy, and more. During our 2020 program, we engaged over 90,000 voters. In 2022, we want urban leaguers to know it's not just the federal elections that should garner your attention, but rather elections on every level. As we've always known, all politics are local. We need you engaged in your school boards and choosing your governors, mayors, all state and local representatives in legislative bodies, district attorneys, and judicial seats. In 2020, Black voters nationally improved their voting engagement by 3% over 2016. Imagine if we continue to show that we want our voices heard and that if you don't listen, we'll make the changes we need. So please check out this highlight video to see how we began our civic engagement work this year at the Reclaim Your Vote rally at Clark Atlanta University. Okay, we've set the stage for this morning's discussion. To help us rethink activism, please welcome our panelists, starting with a good friend of the Urban League, an educator and writer who has also emerged as one of the country's most progressive and effective public servants, Newark Mayor Roz Baraka. How are you? Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. I'm I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited to be on a panel with you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Next is a gifted attorney and former assistant attorney general for the Office of Justice Programs at the U.S. Department of Justice under President Obama. She's now the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Carol Mason. Thank you. Welcome, Carol. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation today. Absolutely. And I need to call you Miss Mason. It is an honor for you to be here with us, Miss Mason. Um, I, I cannot tell you all how, how excited I am to have you both here. I'm gonna start right in the heart of the matter. We've marched, we've boycotted, we've marshaled grassroots and elected leaders, we've pushed forward and we have been pushed back, back. Do you really believe that the civil rights movement has exhausted its traditional tactics? And if so, what's next for us? You know, so I, I don't believe that we've exhausted uh, the tactics of the civil rights movement. I think that it's a mistake to give up any uh, weapon or tool that you have. You have to use as many of them as you can uh, and you don't give it away. You don't give weapons away. And uh, it's important for us to understand that and use that. I think the coordination of all of the things that we use is, is what's missing a little bit, right? And I think, uh, you know, being able to coordinate uh, some of the on the ground activities the direct action with the kind of legislative and administrative work that's happening uh, simultaneously is important. And folks have to begin to communicate and talk to one another. I think what has happened is that there's been a great divide that's been uh, put between a lot of folks uh, in the movement who are carrying out these things, uh, folks on the ground, away from legislators, away from administrators. Uh, and we're not really planning. I mean, there's no discussion between Martin Luther King and and, and the folks of Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee and uh, there's, there's no discussion between the leaders of, of, of many of these things and grassroots folks that are in the community. I think those things have to be uh, happening all of the time. Uh, we have to understand that we're not going to always agree specifically on things, especially if there are 10 things on the table, we might disagree on two or three of them. 
we cannot get up and walk away uh, from the discussion on that. And we have to understand that there are nuances to this and that uh, obviously because we don't ag agree on everything doesn't make us enemies. And sometimes we get rid of our allies, uh, you know, uh, because we're angry at some things that they did or said or whatever, and we get rid of allies. And that's uh, has been a detriment to us for, uh, for very recently. And so we, we can't do that. We, we have to be together all the time. Even if we have to go in, indoors and struggle with each other as much as we can and be able to come out and say, this is the law. This is what we've planning on doing. This is what we can agree on. And this is what we're going to fight for collectively. But that, that just has to happen. I appreciate that. I really do. And um, I'd like to give you, Ms. Mason, the opportunity to respond. So I absolutely agree with Mayor Brock. And I think that one of the challenges we have is, is, is I remember a, a town hall two years ago with, with Congressman Lewis and President Obama. We talked about how do we, how do we channel the, the wisdom of the elders with the impatience of the youth? And, and I think that that's what we've got to figure out. We've got tools. We've got the old uh, tools from the civil rights movement, but we've got new tools that the young people know how to use. And I think the challenge is trying to figure out how do we harness that protest to move it to impact. But one thing I, I hope we all see and recognize is that protest means that people still have hope and expectations for change. They believe that change is possible. So, so we should continue to embrace protest as a sign that we still believe that we can make the changes, but there are lots of vehicles and tools and mechanisms that we need to use in order to move that protest to change. And I think that 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 there are new tools, social media and those things, but we as some of the elders, I'll call myself an elder, I don't know if Mayor Baraka would put himself in that category yet, yeah. uh, but we've got to also show them how change happens. I know here at John Jay College, I encouraged our students in the post George Floyd era to really protest me because I needed their voices to push our faculty on issues. And what we wound up as, with as a result of their protest was that our university community as a whole consensus adopted seven principles of an anti-racist curriculum so that we could again reshape and rethink how are we educating our young people and preparing them to go out in the world and make change. Absolutely, I appreciate that. And I wanna tell you as a, as a person in the Urban League movement, I think the Urban League movement is really to be commended for ensuring that the grassroots vote voices are heard and always at the table and there is alignment when it's necessary. And to both of your points, that doesn't always win you friends, but it certainly doesn't um, have to make you enemies. And I think it's important for us to really be strategic about what we do and how we move forward. But I also think we have been hit at every angle in the last couple of years. I, I really do feel like things are just as bad as they have ever been. And so in our lifetimes, right? And I'm, so I'm not to suggest that there haven't been harder times, but many of us have not lived through the things that we are seeing now. And so let's talk about one of those. The need to protect voting rights and access have dominated this entire conference. Everybody's talking about it. It speaks to the effectiveness of voting as a tool for liberation that the far right is working so hard to suppress black access. What's the plan if they should, should succeed in choking off our voice and influence at the polls? What's the plan? I, for one, am not going to concede that they're going to choke off our vote. Uh, they may be winning the legislative battles and putting up new barriers and obstacles to voting, but we're smart, resilient people. And, and they had many obstacles back years ago. A friend of mine's mother is 93, and we were talking about this. And she said, I remember when we were being lynched in order to vote. And we still persisted. And I think that what we, what we need to be doing now is the organizing that Mayor Baraka was talking about is we've got to keep all of our partners together and pushing on these issues and outsmart them. We know what the rules are and we know how we, what to do to address them. I, I'm, I'm, I vote in Georgia. And when they said you can't feed people online or bring them water, I said, fine, bus people in with their lunches in their hands so that they've got them or have a, have a system where people hold places in line while somebody goes to eat. We've got to outsmart them. We're smart people, we're resilient. We know what the barriers are. Let's just figure out a plan to address it and demonstrate that you can try every tactic you can to restrict and suppress our right to vote, but our voices matter. We are determined to vote and we're gonna do it. Thank you. Yeah. I would have to echo that sentiment completely. Um, it's just awful that we really have to struggle with this and really 
really contemplate these things right now, uh, you know, that this far <laughs> into the evolution of democracy in America, we're still dealing with these kind of specific uh, issues that are at its base racist. And, you know, I, I think it, it also speaks to why we need to be organized better uh, and the fact that we have not been because they are penetrating things that should have been settled some time ago. Uh, we, we, we have to do better and understand that and convince our folks uh, that it's important for us to raise our voices around this uh, and unite around this and begin to push back against their pushback, right? So it, it, any, a, a body at rest remains at rest until acted upon by some force, right? So if it's moving in one direction, it needs to be met with an equal and opposite force. And we're obviously not meeting it with an equal and opposite force because it's continuing to move in the wrong direction. Uh, and so we have to stop it and begin to turn it around and, and figure out how to do that. So it's two ways. Well, you know, we obviously have to be use our ingenuity and be smart enough to outsmart them and navigate around these things and continue to push. And that's important because we have to vote to get people in office in order to combat these things legislatively. That has to happen, you know, and, and then the other side of it, we have to raise our voices continuously uh, to make it clear that this is unacceptable and undemocratic. Absolutely. I, and I can't say enough about the need to organize, the need to organize and the need to hold elected officials accountable. Can we talk about yeah. that for just one moment? Talk to me about how we go about holding elected officials accountable when we have elected them to do a thing that they then don't deliver on. Well, then I think because I'm in that category. So I think it's important for us to really figure out, have we actually listed the things that we want from elected officials when they go into office? Like, have we actually had a conversation with them that that's very clear uh, and coherent? These are the things that we need you to protect. And these are the things that we're, we're organizing around. And are we staying in touch with these people to make sure that they actually have a strategy to achieve these goals? Sometimes we put people in these positions and we assume that they have the wherewithal or the capacity to do the things that we're asking them to do on their own. Uh, and most people who get in these positions are afraid to admit that they may not know how to do it or that it's too heavy for them. Uh, and, and, it, and it is supposed to be too heavy because the bigger the thing you're trying to move, the heavier it becomes, which actually means you need help lifting it and you can't do it by yourself or you'll be crushed under the weight of it. So it's important to employ community organizations and nonprofits and other groups to help you carry this agenda along and not pretend that you can do it on your own. And so you need to be in constant communication with these folks. And if they refuse, so it's a difference between not having the resources to push this thing through and, ref and refusal. And we have to be clear on that. Like, and, and if there's refusal, then we have to reelect somebody else. Uh, and then think about what are the characteristics and, and the things that we look are looking for in a person that would allow us to give them, give us, give them our support. I mean, as Mayor Baraka said, I think the key thing for people to understand is their responsibility doesn't stop on the day they vote. That we've got to stay engaged, keep talking. And and I'm obviously not elected official, but I, what I hear Mayor Baraka saying is that that people who are elected listen to the voices of people who speak loudly and join them in the conversation. So I think that what we've got to do is keep our young people, everybody motivated to vote, how important it is to show up and vote, and then how important it is to continue to show up. Public meetings happen in public spaces, show up, be in the conversation, not just in the public spaces, but also being in a conversation with the electeds again, with Mayor Baraka said, making it clear what your expectations are and showing up to be able to be partners to help in that success. Because I think that one of the things, uh, my, my focus has been in public safety issues and creating safe communities. And I think in order to do that, we Mayor Barack and his team have demonstrated partnership with the community is key to achieving that. Absolutely, and I can tell you, um, we look forward to the day when we have a country full of strong leaders like Mayor Baraka. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are really responsive 
to the needs of the people that we serve every single day who are waking up thinking about our people and how to move the agenda forward because we definitely understand that if you really lift up those that the urban league and other organizations are serving um the entire country will be better so i appreciate that and 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 really i want to, us to get out of settling for the lesser of evils right that's what we're often doing when we go to the polls so i think i hope that people are paying attention and taking notes um on what you all are saying because we definitely have to move forward in a different direction Let's talk about something else. Earlier um, in another conversation, there was some conversation around um, George Floyd and the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. One of the most striking developments of that summer was the response of corporate America and the widespread statements of solidarity and calls for justice, racial justice. Two years later, we see the situation in Florida between Governor DeSantis and Disney which shows how far some on the right are willing to go to punish major corporations for what they see as a woke agenda. What does this shift mean for civil rights and future engagement by corporate partners? I'll start with you, Ms. Mason. So um, that's a really powerful, interesting question. I think that, that um, we all ought to embrace the concept of being woke. It's not a pejorative. I think it's a badge of honor to say that we want to hear from our community. We want to hear everyone's voices. We want to see them. So I hope what we do is, again, use the, the multiple tools that we have. We have tools as consumers and we have tools as, as voters um, and, 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 employ and big employers have employees who need to raise their voices. So I think that if we continue to make sure that these are things that we as consumers, employees, um, voters care about, they ought to want to hear from us. They ought to want to support the success of, of all communities. And I think that's the challenge of, of not um, shying away from labels that people want to make a pejorative and say, no, embrace it. Embrace the change. Embrace wanting to create a world where everybody has an opportunity to succeed. That, that, that would be my answer. But let me, let me, can I just dig deeper on your answer? Because that what I, what, but what happens to the corporation that is celebrating their final awakening and then they are suffering they they are then hit with these sort of um you know um damages or you know they're they're attacked because of their position and so I'll it's either not clear it's not clear what the end result is in florida because if you read what's in the news uh, you know they may have enacted that but somebody's still got to pay that debt that billion plus dollar debt Mm -hmm. And that's going to fall on some taxpayers who may be celebrating what the governor says we should be doing until it realizes, ooh, that's my pocketbook. Okay. So I, I don't think we need to just think the story's over. Um, but I think that if corporations um, hold true to their values, and if we hold them true to their values as consumers and employees, I think that's where the strength comes from. Um, but I think the story is still to be written, but I, I, I am a firm believer that if you live the values that you espouse, that ultimately you ought to prevail. And, and, and it takes a, a level of courage to be able to do those specific things, uh, knowing that there is, and the reason you have to do it because there's a force of people that are out there who are trying to dismantle democracy. Who are trying, I mean, the opposite of woke is sleep. I mean, that's, I mean, what are you saying? Like you want everybody to be asleep. You want us not to pay attention to what's going on. It's just ridiculous that people are able to turn something like that into a pejorative, into something negative. Uh, and we should be embracing that. It should make us, you know, grab it tighter and push uh, harder on it. And, uh, you know, any corporation that, that raises the idea of democracy, and we need to push them even further than they're going because we settle for names on the back of helmets, for slogans at the the end zone of the football field. Like we should be pushing them for more things and not settle for them just making statements. I, I think we have to organize and begin talking about what do we want after you say, this is something that we need to do. Well, what are you doing? Uh, and what are the steps to, to get that done? And where are the organizations that can receive this, uh, you know, these things and make sure that our community is benefiting from it. Uh, that's, that's what we have to do and, and, and show folks that are willing to stand with us that we'll, we'll also stand with them. Uh, and, and that's important. And, 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 I, and I really appreciate both your answers. And I think that piece about being willing to stand with corporate partners as they are attacked 
for standing with us is going to be key as we move forward, because I imagine that we'll see a lot more of that. One of the most striking aspects of the George Floyd protest across the country was the diversity. It was a reminder of how broad coalitions drove so many of the civil rights victories of the 50s and 60s. In a nation that is so divided, how can we build on this cross-cutting momentum and build actionable consensus on equality? So the reason why what happened with George Floyd really impacted me is that when I was at the Department of Justice, we funded uh, something called the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And it was designed to make sure we never had a Michael Brown situation again. And so when George, so, so Minneapolis was one of our pilot sites and we invested millions of dollars in years in making sure that every sworn and civilian officer in that police department had um, implicit bias training, procedural justice training, worked with racial reconciliation in the community and yet George Floyd happened. And so for me, that, that, that was a gut punch to me because I thought, what did we not get right by making this investment? We knew that it wasn't a one and done, it required sustained effort, but it caused me to rethink my framing around all these issues. So what we did at John Jay in partnership with the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Noble, was we decided to convene a series of conversations um, uh, with, with multiple stakeholders, interested people. We had voices across the political spectrum. We had political leaders, business leaders, philanthropic leaders, grassroots leaders, law enforcement leaders, union, you know, rank and file police officers, and having a conversation around what is the future of public safety? Because to me, the conversation about fund or defund the police wasn't the right conversation. The conversation was, how do we create safe communities? And Mayor Baraka just led an effort for the National League of Cities to talk about reimagining public safety. And, and I was convinced that if we got all these people together with different views, that we would come to consensus. And we reached nine points of consensus in our future public safety report. And the bottom line is everybody wants to live in a community that's safe and where they have an opportunity to thrive. And the question then is where do we make the investments and how do we create those communities? And, and we all know where we need to make the investments, schools, education, good jobs, quality housing, food, access to food, all the you know mental health services. And then we can think about what is, once we've made those investments, then what is the role of law enforcement in that context? Because we will have created a community where people have an opportunity to thrive and partner with each other. And one key element of that is understanding the racial trauma that's happening in this country. One of the, you know, we all saw George Floyd and thought this is, you know, people were using the phrase moment. And I was like, I don't want this to be a moment. This has got to be a sustained effort. And I knew at some point the emphasis would change, but we've got to stay dedicated, diligent about this work and not worry about the fact that it may not be on everybody's front burner right now. And one of the things that really caught my attention was last year was the 50th anniversary of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. And when you saw the, 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 the footage around that in the images, they replicated a lot of images we're still seeing today. And I don't wanna be 50 years later telling, well, I won't be here, but the generation behind me 50 years later to say, they got it wrong in 2022. I want them to say, we got it right because we remained focused, even though people aren't paying the same attention we want, we remain focused and diligent. And those of us in these spaces need to make sure that we don't let our focus get distracted just because the, the national attention is not on it. And I, I think it requires sustained effort like Mayor Baraka is doing in Newark to make sure that we're building these partnerships, focusing on the long-term investments we need to made, make in order to address the systemic racial inequities so that we're equipping this, the, the younger generation to have a better footing to succeed going forward. Thank you. Mayor Baraka. Yeah, that, that was pretty comprehensive. I would add a, a, a few things, but um, you know, ultimately, you know, it's important that we understand that some of those police officers just have to go. That's when we talking about some of this stuff. Some of these people just they've been there too long. They have the wrong ideas. Some of these people are racist. They just got to go. And we have to in that begin to recruit police officers that, that are different and begin to train them differently from the very from the onset. So that that's part of all the other stuff, stuff that was talked about as well. But we also have to give room to local elected officials to begin to reduce crime because what, what happens is you're in these communities trying to do this 
kind of uh, constitutional policing and, and, and violence is happening in your community. And the very people who you think are gonna be your allies around this uh, become very vocal about uh, your inability uh, to reduce crime. And then people automatically equate the reduction of crime with more police in our community, right? If you, in a suburban community, if you see police, you think something has gone wrong. Uh, what are the police doing here? Uh, in our community, unfortunately, when you go to community meetings, a lot of us are, are harassed because people don't see the police. They're like, well, the police ain't in my neighborhood. They don't get out their cars. They don't do anything. So under-policing is also a strategy to, to hurt us as well. Like people don't feel like people care about their well-being. We have, so we have to convince people that their well-being and public safety is not just about police. That public safety, uh, the first word of public safety is actually public. And that the public has to be involved in the reduction of violence and crime in their community. And if we have a collective sense of it, then the police become a part of a holistic strategy and not the strategy. And I think people can begin to wrap their head around that when they begin to see that the police are part of a larger strategy and not the only thing that we have uh, to reduce violence and crime in our community. I think that's the way we need to uh, discuss it, the way we need to uh, put it, uh, contextualize it, and the way we need to move forward on it, uh, saying that, yeah, we need police in our community, but we need all these other things as well, right? Uh, because you can't have uh, public safety without the public involved. And I think police begin to understand that too. Those who truly are interested uh, in creating a, an environment that's safe, uh, who live in these communities, whose families live in these communities, who know uh, these communities, I think that they are more equipped at least emotionally to understand that people in those neighborhoods need to be safe and there's a larger way to do this besides them. Absolutely. Can I piggyback on that answer? I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know, John Jay College was created as a police college 50 plus years ago because people had the vision in the 60s to understand that they wanted to create law enforcement leaders um, who, who under, were part of the communities and understood how to be better partners with the communities and thought that having a liberal arts education was critical to that. And so what George Floyd also did for, for us here at John Jay is to think about how are we educating this next generation of law enforcement officers who are going all across the country, they're, just not, they're not just here in New York City, and making sure that when I say that they're going out with a different understanding of, of what their role is and with communities. And we're living that. We're making sure that our students are getting educated about the history of different communities so they understand the communities in which they're going to partner and serve, because I think that's the key word is serve. Um, and, and, and we've got to help the law enforcement officers understand how to partner with communities, how to understand the trauma that many communities have faced and also make sure that they understand that they are in fact partners with the community and those community voices are critical in order for us to create these safer communities. Again, that's what Mayor Baraka has done very, very well in, in, in Newark and brought their numbers down. We were on a panel together uh, that I moderated last year and the then commissioner of police in New York wanted to understand how did Mayor Baraka do what he did in bringing the, the number of shootings to zero. Um, and, and I think that, that the reality is, yes, there is an uptick in violence. And I think the challenge is combating the narrative with what the reality is and the people not getting caught up in the narrative and the fear and really staying disciplined and focused on where are the levers of change and where are the levers to create safe communities? Because if it were easy, we'd, we'd have solved the problem. It's right. not easy, but we've got to stay in conversation because if we start just arguing with each other and not listening, nobody wins. That's right. Yeah, I also think that it is it's so important for uh, Black America to just remind America that racism is a threat to our national security. And I don't think we talk about that often enough. We can never be prepared to be the country we are supposed to be as long as you have a group of people who don't feel that they can live or get to the American dream, right? And so we've got to figure out a way to make sure that everyone in this country feels like they have hope in their household, in their community, in their city, in their country. So we've got to make sure that we really are creating that. And again, I think at the Louisville Urban League and urban leagues across the country, I mean, our focus being jobs, justice, education, health, and housing, what we are saying to this country is this is how 
you create public safety. It's to invest in affordable housing. How can you expect a child who doesn't know where they're going to eat or sleep tonight or tomorrow to have any sort of hope or preparation or desire even for a future? So, you know, we've really got to talk more about some of that. When will we see budgeted budgets really redirecting funding toward affordable housing? towards really, you know, educational outcomes and achievement gaps being closed. Why do we always talk about police when we talk about improving our communities and our community's health? Why do we allow them to own the conversation in that way? We're right. smarter than that. And what we've got to do, and, I, and this is what you all have been saying, and this is what you've said over the years, because I've watched you, we have to lead these conversations in right. our community. Nobody has the answers for us, but us. Other people can align with us and help us, but we know who we are. We know what we need and we've got to begin to define that. And that's why your leadership is so important. And I just wanna, again, just thank you all so much for what you are doing in the seats that you hold. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, let's let me shift it a little bit. And it's sort of piggybacking on the last question, but I wanna talk about this generation gap that we that some people um, think that we have. I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but is there a generation gap dividing the social justice movement? Uh, how do we best merge hard won experience with young energy and innovation for effective advocacy? And I think you all have talked about this a little bit. I know Ms. Mason, I think you did, but I wanna give you the opportunity to really flesh your thoughts out. So, so one thing, and I just wanted to piggyback on your last comment about the role of the Urban League, and I think how important it is for your voices to be talking about why we have this federal stimulus money coming into communities, how we need to hold elected officials accountable for using that to address these systemic issues that the National Urban League is focused on. But in terms of the generation um, issue, I, I, I'm lucky uh, that I work every day with young people and I get to learn from them. And I tell you, it, it, it is an education. Um, and you've got to keep an open mind. And, and it is hard sometimes to, because I, I, I am still, I am in the body of a 65 year old and I still see the world in a binary way that they don't see. But I think that because they see uh, possibilities and see the world without the, the constraints that my generation saw, that, that they've got more creative solutions. And I think the challenge is making sure we stay connected to them, close to them, that their voices are in the conversations with us, even though it may be hard. Um, and that talking together, and I think that's critical, and I know that National Urban League, and I know that Mayor Baraka creates spaces where, where we're in conversation together because that's how we learn from each other. They don't have all the answers, neither do we. Uh, we, we. We have different ideas about what some of the problems are, and I think that, that you know, again, you were saying you, people talk about being the people who are proximate to the problem have the best, best solutions. Well, the young people have a different proximity to the problem and they also have different expectations because we've raised them thinking that that this country really is going to live up to the ideals on which it was right. founded and now we've got to figure out how to how to deliver on what we raised them to expect. Oh my gosh, that is so powerful. That is so powerful. Thank you for that. Mayor Barack, I want to get yeah. you in another Yeah, question. that's 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 right on the target. Um you know, there's obviously differences between uh, uh, generations always has been. I mean, you know, whether it be music or things you like, it's just real. I mean, to deny that uh, would be uh, to operate from a, a point of view that's not real. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's important to have conversations uh, as was stated and important to create spaces where we could dialogue with one another. I think, you know, something that affects all of us, you know, President Obama began talking about it just recently. I think just the social media, uh, the the, the, the level of misinformation uh, and our inability to come together and have face-to-face, -to, -face, to have conversations, to go to conferences like we used to, to be able to have real dialogue is just missing. We take, uh, you know, sound bites and, you know, short uh, titles and taglines on social media and we run with it as opposed to doing the actual study, the actual reading, the actual desire to have a conversation about how we move forward. And I think that that has become a problem. People have used that to create a larger wedge where a wedge does not really exist. Uh, you know, a perceived uh, kind of inability for us to, to have conversation, for us to, to be able to come together through this. 
Uh, and we have to be sophisticated enough to understand that that's what's happening and see that and find ways around that and call people uh, to the table and begin having real conversations with each other in person and start talking with one another, create whether it's creating study groups, uh, opportunities for people to, to learn what's happening in, in both ways, not, not just you know, elders and young people, but just the, the information period, right? Yeah, back and forth. We, we just need to create that space in order for us to have, when I, when I was coming up, I would, there was a conference almost every other month that I was able to go to, they're able to attend all, all over New York City, Washington, DC. I traveled to all these places, listening to people speak, reading their books, having conversations, going to rallies, all kinds of things. And, and a lot of those spaces aren't there anymore because we, we substituted a lot of that uh, for what's going on on social media. And social media is great, don't get me wrong, but I think that, uh, you know, our folks uh, are not using it in the way uh, that our enemies have become experts at. Absolutely. And that's and that's really many of the tools, right? We need to we need to hone our expertise with many of the tools that our enemies are using. And so um, I've got just a few minutes. I want to ask you another question and I want you all to wrap up with this question and add anything that you'd like to add, because I realize this is a big topic and there's so much more to say and our time is short. So what I'd like for you to do is, it, you know this, right? We've seen it. Those who oppose equality have shown their willingness to destroy democracy to achieve their ends. They would do whatever it takes. They have completely thrown out the rule book. How can we fight back in ways that are constructive rather than destructive? And we already know we need everybody at the table, young and old, seasoned, unseasoned. We need everybody. But how do we fight back? Give us that answer and also anything else that you'd like to add in this last, um, these last closing moments. Thank you. So I'll piggyback on what May Baraka said about learning from their playbook. Um, for 30 years, I was a public finance lawyer and did a lot of school bond financing. And I watched as the school boards were changing who was, who was running for and being elected to the school boards. And at the time I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I didn't see their long-term strategy. We gotta, we gotta, copy their playbook and then take it a lot further. So we've got to be, we've got to engage people in voting and under, we've got to really get people to understand it's important to participate in this democracy. Voting is step one, but there are many other steps to continue to show up, use your voice. Um, and, and, and I was in a meeting recently where somebody said that, that, that uh, usually hope is a byproduct of the results we want. And instead they flipped the script and they said, Hope is a driver of the change we want to see. And, and we know that. We've seen that historically. And so we've got to figure out how do we create this impetus again where people understand that we can make this change through showing up, participating at every single level. It's not just the presidential election. It's every single race, every single meeting. And even if your representatives aren't who you want them to be, you still got to show up and use your voice because it's powerful and, and can make change. Uh, and I would, you know, to me, hope is the opposite of depression. It's the absence of depression. And it is, 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 it is our uh, ability to, to win small victories. You know, you win small victories, you get hope. And the more hopeful you become, the more determined you get to get into the end. Uh, and that's important. We have to win small victories. A lot of folks don't not interested in, in the small victories, but we need those. We need small local victories, whatever they may be to make people believe that is obviously and actually hopeful to get to the end. A lot of people have lost uh, th their sense of hope. They've lost, they've created, uh, become very cynical about this movement period. Uh, and I think that's, we need to end that. And uh, as Stokely, uh, Carmichael, Kwame Ture, I used to go to those, all those conferences, you say, organize, 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 organize. You have to be in an organization. People must be organized. They have, I agree with that wholeheartedly. That, that hit me so hard when I was a, uh, in college, you have to be in an organization. You have to be a part of some organization because individually you can't get much done. You have to be a part of something larger and bigger, uh, whether it's the Urban League or anything else. You have to be a part of that. Uh, and then we have to, as organizations, begin to talk to each other and strategize about how to get these things done because you might have a good plan, but your plan by itself uh, is not the total answer. And you have to be humble enough to understand that you need more people on your team. Uh, and, and, and you don't have everything that we need by yourself. 
I, I love, can I just, I love what he was saying because this work is not proprietary. We've got to build the trust to, to do this work together because that's the only way we're going to do this is if we're locked arm in arm in this journey to make this democracy work. We need to be organized. We need to be together. We need to welcome everyone to the table. We need to be courageous and we need to have hope. I want to tell you all, thank you so much, not just for being here, but for the work you're doing and for showing your courage. I think that your comments today have moved us all forward. There's much more ahead in day two of our virtual legislative policy conference. And as we transition to our next panel on tech literacy, please listen to this message from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Evan Dixon, president of Global Fix Broadband at Viaset. We are committed to supporting the National Urban League's goal of making internet universally available to anyone who wants it. We are all in on this goal. That's what we're all about here at Viaset. And we are especially honored to partner with all of you that are part of the League to help you create widespread digital inclusion as key to equity and equality of opportunity at the local and national level. And to do so now through immediate satellite internet access. We hope you enjoy this video. At Viasat, we believe, as we know you do, that everyone deserves a reliable, quality internet connection, no matter where they live. Satellite broadband is the fastest, most cost-effective way to connect entire communities, and to do it now. Providing critical internet access where it's needed most, getting people the critical education, healthcare, and job access they need when they need it going where cable and fiber internet won't go, giving people a better option when it comes to internet providers, helping them connect to what matters most, turning bedrooms into classrooms, making house calls from thousands of miles away, opening doors to jobs and new opportunities for a fully inclusive America, helping people make sense of the world and find their place in it putting more of the world within reach for millions of Americans who are too often left behind. Together, Viasat and the National Urban League can break down digital barriers and provide a reliable, quality internet connection to anyone who wants it. Good afternoon, I'm Melissa Valentin, Senior Director of Technology and Telecommunications Policy, and I want to welcome you to This Is How We Do It, Tech Literacy is the New Language of Civil Rights Progress and Economic Justice. I'm excited to serve as host and moderator for this session brought to you by our supporting sponsors, Verizon and DoorDash. We'll get into the challenges and opportunities of advancing tech in a moment, but first, let's hear from our sponsors beginning with DoorDash. Please watch. I'm Ia. I travel all over just giving out love, wellness, healing, and I do that in my 31-foot mobile community center. DoorDash helps keep the bus on the road. Being a single mom and then being a social entrepreneur, I can't really work your traditional nine-to-five job. DoorDash allows me the time to be free for my son and whatever his needs are. It allows me to make the money that I need to fund my passions. DoorDash makes it possible for me to live my purpose. And now, a message from Verizon. Good afternoon. I am Michelle Kober, Executive Director of External Affairs at Verizon. Verizon is a longstanding partner of the National Urban League and a proud sponsor of the 19th Annual Legislative Policy Conference. 
Today's conversation on tech literacy is one that Verizon cares deeply about. The past two years have shown us that connectivity and technology should be available to all, and we are committed to help close the digital divide. And it is imperative that our communities have the skills they need to thrive in a digital economy. Through our Verizon Innovative Learning Program, we're helping students across the country learn the skills they need to succeed in today's digital world. We're also empowering teachers with remote learning resources, lesson plans, and training. We are committed to training over 10 million youth with digital skills by 2030. We're also expanding access to high quality broadband in underserved rural communities and partnering with 4-H tech change makers to provide digital tech literacy in rural black populations. Working with nine historically black colleges and universities, all land grant institutions, the program will credential teens in the communities to provide training that is expected to empower 15,000 adults with digital skills needed for jobs, education, banking, and healthcare by the end of the year. We're also empowering small businesses with the tools they need to succeed in the digital economy. Through Verizon Small Business Digital Ready, we're providing resources to help 1 million small businesses thrive by 2030. These are just a few of Verizon's efforts to further our long-standing commitment to economic and societal advancement for all. I look forward to the discussion today and I'm hopeful that the great work of NUL on this issue will continue to benefit communities nationwide. Thank you, Verizon and DoorDash for your partnership. Our next order of business is a presentation of our next NUL 2022 Congressional Champion Award. Here to do the honors is the president and CEO of the National Urban League, Mark H. Morial. Thank you, Elisa, and welcome to the Urban League team. We dedicate today's session to inclusive technology and its potential to empower and advance our communities. But as we explore how we can leverage tech to our advantage, we must also consider the people that are being left out of this ecosystem that provides some with limitless opportunities. We want at this moment to recognize Congressman Frank Pallone. Frank has been a strong supporter of infrastructure, of the entire infrastructure bill, which includes a commitment to broadband. That infrastructure bill will build highways and roadways and airports and railways. It'll repair broken water systems, invest in broadband. It's the most comprehensive, far-reaching, forward-looking infrastructure bill passed in our nation's history. It was bipartisan. It'll help to close the digital divide by making broadband more accessible, deal with clean water issues, and also creating jobs, 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 jobs that help rebuild America's working and middle classes. The champion of this bill is none other than the chair of the powerful House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and our next Congressional Champion Award honoree, Congressman Frank Pallone Jr. of the state of New Jersey. He represents the sixth district and he's been a leader and a partner to the National Urban League as we sought to pass the infrastructure bill, which echoed our Main Street Marshall Plan and laid the groundwork for long overdue investments in our nation that will spur economic growth for a generation and close the widening divide between the haves and the have nots, especially for communities of color. These successes set the bar for how government must and should work on behalf of people. We applaud Congressman Pallone for demonstrating leadership, integrity, and a commitment to equity. So if you'd please join me in congratulating our National Urban League 2022 Congressional Champion Award winner, Representative Frank Pallone, Jr. I want to thank Mark and the National Urban League for this Congressional Champion Award. I admire all the tremendous work the National Urban League has done to address the very real disparities that exist in broadband access and affordability. 
your Lewis Latimer plan for digital equity and inclusion was a thoughtful roadmap based on the fundamental principle that every household in America should have access to broadband networks. And as you well know, access to broadband infrastructure is not the only barrier that prevents most people from subscribing to home broadband. Adoption and affordability of service affect many more people, and that's why I'm so proud that Congress, working with advocates like the National Urban League, passed numerous programs over the last 18 months to address all three, including the historic $65 billion investment in the bipartisan infrastructure law signed into law by President Biden last November. The law will help to deliver high-speed broadband to areas that do not already have high-quality broadband, including rural, urban, and suburban communities. And the program also requires providers that receive this funding offer a low-cost service plan. The bipartisan infrastructure law also created and funded three digital equity programs to help ensure that people have the skills and tools they need to connect when they have access. And finally, it addresses affordability through the Affordable Connectivity Program, giving eligible households a discount of $30 every month on their internet bill, or $75 a month for people in high cost areas and those living on tribal lands. So I'm hopeful that these programs will help us make progress towards ensuring that everyone can be part of the digital economy. So thank you again for this award, and I look forward to continuing to work with the National Urban League on closing the digital divide. Let me congratulate Frank Pallone again for our Congressional Champion Award. And I'm proud again to introduce Joy Cheney. As many of you have seen with the National Urban League's Lewis Latimer Plan for Digital Equity and Inclusion, and in our continued advocacy around closing the digital divide, we believe that access to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet is a civil right. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has made a historic investment in broadband, including affordable broadband, which can transform the lives of Black, Latinx, and low-income people across this country. That is why we are thrilled about the $14 billion affordable connectivity program. This program helps ensure that households can afford the broadband they need to get access to jobs, education, and health care. Small businesses, too. The benefit provides a discount of up to $30 per month toward internet service for eligible households and up to $75 per month for households on qualifying tribal lands. Eligible households can also receive a one-time discount of up to $100 to purchase a laptop, desktop computer, or a tablet from participating providers. We encourage you to learn more about the Affordable Connectivity Program and to pass along this information to members of your family and in your broader community. Learn more at getinternet.gov or by scanning the QR code you see on your screen. Let's get connected. And now I'm going to send it back to Elisa. Now it's time to introduce our esteemed panelists including principal of MLC Strategies and former FCC commissioner and chairwoman, Mignon Clyburn, Bertram Lee Jr., senior policy counsel for data decision-making and artificial intelligence at the Future of Privacy Forum, and Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. So panelists, let's just go ahead and dive right into the conversation. Let's talk about where we are with technology. There's been a clear shift over the last few years of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're more dependent than ever on tech to help us learn, to help us work, to connect with family and friends, and even to access healthcare. And tech has also become a vehicle for political action and social activism. So what's the outlook for Black communities in this tech ecosystem? Where do we stand currently and where are we going? I'm going to start with my former boss when I was an intern in her office, Commissioner Clyburn. Well, thank you so much um, for having me. How I will answer that or approach this is um, look in the mirror and, and, and look a, a, about and around you. Uh, so if you want to make predictions when it comes to technology, uh, you know, digital empowerment or the lack thereof, 
just look at what is happening now, who you are, where you are, and, and what you are. Now, if you are among the uh, tech savvy, uh, digitally empowered, you have robust opportunities and connectivity, the future is as bright as any other demographic. Uh, opportunities abound, um, you are empowered, uh, your creative juices are flowing, you are your grandparents' dream. You have the opportunity to do that through these platforms. Now, if you are among us and you have a broadband connection, you've got um, the, the, the tools needed, um, but you are not taking advantage of your full capacity, uh, then uh, you're going to fall a little short. You're going to be somewhat limited. Uh, and the future may not be as bright as those who are a bit more savvy and engaged in life. But if you are among the too many that are under or unconnected, either by way of infrastructure, um, by way of connectivity challenges because you can't afford it, um, or other types of barriers, then not only is the future uh, you know, for you um, extremely shaky, to be honest with you going forward, I would use the word bleak um, because the rest of the world or a lot of the rest of the world um, is, is going to be continuing to move forward. Governments around the globe are investing um, at, at, at you know, record paces. Um, they have learned the lessons that we still, I think are struggling with that we're getting better. And um, uh, you know, there's going to be this growing divide, um, uh, these cliffs of haves and have-nots. So I say it's where you are, where you sit, um, uh, you know, how the environment looks around you. But this is not a mystery. So uh, in an analog world, this was a predictor of what the digital experiences, um, you know, portend. So it's not a mystery. Um, it's just a tool, it's a platform. Um, there are pathways or segues, um, but they are amplifiers of what we have now. So when we talk about digital um, you know, challenges or divides or, 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 or Nicole and Bertram are gonna be better at the word choices, um, just look at us now. And if we're not careful and put our uh, thumbs on the scale, uh, it will be more of the same. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, Dr. Turner Lee, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I think uh, Commissioner Clyburn actually hit it on the head, right? We're at this inflection point. We've always known that we've had a digital divide. We've had the haves and the have-nots when it comes to broadband service, when it comes to an internet-enabled device. But the difference is, and I'm not going to put out my age nor the commissioners, that now, 20 years later, what we're actually finding is that the internet has moved from a marketplace luxury into a public good. And I think the pandemic demonstrated when we saw people actually having to go online for work. We saw young people having to actually virtually learn. We saw healthcare, like you said, Elisa, you saw this in the commissioner's office that you just recently left. When we saw those things migrate to the internet, it became very important to democratize access to it. So I think going forward, it's very important for us to understand, and I sort of refer to it as the digitally invisible. Uh, I think that there's a stage that we're at we have to consider the fact that the people who are on the wrong side of digital opportunity were already on the wrong side of economic, social, and political realities way before the pandemic hit. We are now seeing that the lack of equity that exists between the haves and the have-nots in this country more broadly, based on how much you make, where you live, what your literacy is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, your age, demographic, that's actually showing up because now technology is really driving the productive capacities of our economy. So I really would say, you know, as a sociologist, as a person who is committed to this as a civil rights uh, champion with the many of folks on this call here, we've got to figure this out because this is the next civil rights challenge that we have. Definitely. And Bert, is there anything that you would like to add? Well, first I want to say thank you to the National Urban League uh, for having me on this panel on the, with such distinguished guests. 
And I actually wanted to start by saying thank you to Commissioner Clyburn, Dr. Turner Lee, and you, Ms. Valentine, um, because much of my work, particularly on AI, is based on a lot of the work that you all have done um, in the technology space, particularly as you all have advocated for marginalized communities. And so it's always a great honor whenever I get to speak to any of you, let alone be on a panel with you all, with the three of you. And so I'm just truly grateful and just wanted to start in a place from a place of gratitude. And secondly, um, I wanted to kind of speak specifically on AI, um, and I think we're at a critical juncture with respect to AI's role in society. Um, opportunities that used to include human decision making are now almost entirely algorithmic. Uh, we have a chance in this moment um, to possibly eliminate historical systems of inequality if we can thoughtfully engage with what artificial intelligence and algorithmic decision making look like for marginalized communities, both in America and across the world. Uh, we are at this critical juncture where um, if we do not think proactively about how data um, and particularly AI and algorithmic systems impact marginalized communities, we could see ourselves reliving um, past inequalities at a massive scale and at a scale that we won't be able to control as these systems will be autonomous and be able to make decisions for themselves with little um, human input. And so we need to be thoughtful about how we include marginalized communities in both the future of the world, but in the future of the internet, and also in the future of society with the prevalence of these algorithmic and artificial intelligence tools. Great, thank you so much. So let's lean in and talk a little bit more about like social activism and the political action front. How large of a role did tech play during the racial justice protests in the summer of 2020 following the murder of George Floyd and also in the lead up to the 2020 election? Dr. Turner Lee, I'm gonna start with you for that question. So I think the question that you're asking is actually pretty good because I think we've always seen technology sort of as a two-sided coin. There's this one aspect which the Honorable Commissioner has spoken about, which is the fact that we need technology access because the world has shifted from analog to digital. But on the other hand, we as a community, and I love the fact that we're having this conversation at the National Urban League, have actually used the technology to help us with social movements. And as a sociologist, that has sort of graduated us from the telephone tree to the use of the internet to mobilize folks around a variety of issues, most recently the George Floyd shooting. And actually, you know, if we be honest with ourselves, subsequent um, egregious activities against people of color when it comes to policing and otherwise. With that being said, and this sort of goes back to what Bert said, the challenge that we have on the other side of the coin is increased surveillance. And so many people do not realize that as we actually engage in a lot of social activism via technological domains, that we were also being surveilled and trailed. What I was really interested in as a researcher is what we saw the Black Lives Matter movement do, where they told people at some point, don't bring your cell phones to be able to cut off location tracking systems or ensure that you are homogenous in your attire so there's no drone surveillance or protests. As we all know, under that previous guy who we had as president, the kind of nature of what she subjected us to as Black folks when it came to our liberty and civil rights which is you know, one of those grievances that we should have forevermore in our history, right? But what technology has been able to do, I think for us, is to get out quicker into the streets to raise concern and action. And where I like to point out to people, you look at the confirmation of our beautiful Supreme Court justice, a lot of that activity happened with hashtags like win with black women, what the Urban League did to get people to the streets to ensure that win. We're seeing the same activity in the confirmation of the three recent judges. My point is, we have to always be careful as Black folks how we leverage a tool that we did not create and how we actually ensure that this tool is not being used against us in ways that it creates the type of Cointel Pro surveillance that we saw with the Black Panther Party and other social movements prior to. And so I just want to put that out there. I know Bert may have something to add or something uh, you know, interesting on the AI front because we both work in that space. Because not only is that data collected, but it's used in ways where it's analyzed and compiled to really subvert some of the things that we're trying to do for our own equality. And so I'll stop there. But I think it's just really, as a, it's just been so interesting, right, to see these platforms morph into spaces that they weren't designed for. But more importantly, it's been interesting for us to use it and not also recognize some of those um, inherent risks in using someone else's technology. So it's hard for me not to listen to that question and come to it from uh, wearing my old hat. When I say my old hat, 
Uh, some of you know, I had a weekly uh, newspaper for about, uh, I think 14 years, but you know, at 60, things get a little fuzzy. Um, and what it, that reminded me about is um, those gatekeepers, um, those editors that did not allow certain uh, stories uh, to uh, get um, told. Um, those people, you had news blackouts in the 50s and 60s where there were a widespread agreement uh, among newspaper publishers that they were not going to carry uh, things that were happening in the movement because if the story didn't told, get told, if we didn't say it, if it didn't appear in print or, or over um, the, those three or four uh, television stations we had uh, back then, then it didn't happen. And so it was hard for the neighbors um, a few states away to know that there are people fighting um, you know, for justice. Today, with these tools, <laughs> the censors are gone. You know, those who were blocking, um, you know, the news and information that was critical for us that allowed us to know what was happening, that in many cases has enabled us to be closer to parity uh, when it comes to justice. Um, uh, for those who have been just, just wronged, um, you've got in a quick, efficient way, uh, hundreds of cases and evidence of irrefutable evidence, what has happened, where injustices were. Um, you've got that and no one can deny and say, they're gonna say that anyway. They're poised to do that anyway. Now you've got it um, and you cannot deny it. Um, and so that to me is the beauty, the empowerment and yes, the challenge uh, because sometimes we're quick to judge. Um, but by and large, for the most part, um, I will say 100%, you know, even with, um, you know, some deficiencies, this has brought us to a better place, um, you know, more equitable outcomes when it comes to justice and movements, and I'm letting the world know uh, that um, these people have voices, uh, they have been wronged, and you need to see where that wrong is. That is a positive, um, and, um, you know, that I think is the power um, of, of connectivity uh, and ubiquitous uh, access to uh, these uh, 21st century tools. Ellie, can I jump in, Elisa, just for a second, though? Because uh, yeah. I, I think uh, for people who are watching this as well, I do agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, right? I do agree that we have more avenues for us to be able to narrate our stories, particularly in light of the fact that we don't have as much media ownership, which is another problem, which I think contributes to a lot of misinformation and, um, you know, about our community. But I do want to say, I mean, Elon Musk is buying Twitter. <laughs> and I think it's something that we should think about when we begin to think, you know, when we think who is the arbiter of our troops. And I, I find it interesting in listening to this debate. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, this is a big deal in popular media right now. Who's going to actually be the arbiter of the types of troops that go across Twitter? And Elon Musk, who is in the space business, has basically said he wants freedom of speech. The question for Black folks as we look at how these platforms are created and emerge is yes, we need to have access to those platforms. But I think, you know, in my old civil rights hat and voice, I would say we need to also own our own platforms. And the fact that we're so reliant on other people's platforms and tools to be able to organize, it's really a great point for us to think about what Commissioner is talking about when she was a newspaper publisher. To what extent do we have the venues to? narrate our own troops without having somebody make decisions in terms of content moderation as to whether or not that's a positive or not. So I just wanted to put that out there because as these markets become more concentrated and they become more controlled by people who are not as say, what do you think, um, Commissioner, not as a gatekeepers, but people with special interests, then I think it's important for us to know that there's a great line that we may have to pay attention to. Thank you for that. And, you know, National Urban League um, wrote a letter to the Twitter board in opposition of Elon Musk uh, purchasing Twitter. So let me actually, since we're on this note, let's talk a little bit more about disinformation and misinformation. Um, so the executive director of the Washington Bureau and senior vice president of policy and advocacy at the National Urban League, Joy Cheney, has testified before Congress about the prevalence of disinformation and misinformation online. And it is one of the downsides of this new information age. We've seen how disinformation and misinformation compromise the nation's COVID-19 response, how false claims of voter fraud or energizing extremists and threatening the democratic process. 
So what's the state of play in this space? Bert, this is obviously has a lot to do with data, our access to data and the way that our data is used in these algorithmic systems. So I'm going to start with you this time. So my answer is going to fold into the previous question and blend in, I think, the answers of Commissioner Clyburn and Dr. Turner Lee. Um, one, free speech has never been free for marginalized communities. And I think that's something that tech companies are slowly realizing, but it is not happening, I think, with the speed in which it could. Um, because from the perspective of AI and algorithmic systems, we can do a much do a much better job at helping people understand how artificial intelligence works and how algorithmic systems impact their daily lives. And that means that what data they're sharing, what data they're using, um, how this data impacts um, content moderation decisions, um, how that data impacts um, regular decisions about not just content moderation, but how folks get jobs how folks can get access to housing, how folks can get access to a loan. Um, the basic kind of bread and butter civil rights issues are now algorithmic issues. And so as we're thinking about kind of like what a response is um, to kind of like technology companies that have to do content moderation on global scales, the answer is, is that you have to be able to be understanding of the context in which people are coming to your technology, right? Um, the best example that I have is McDonald's, right? Uh, McDonald's in Tokyo is different than McDonald's in Tuscaloosa, right? Um, they have different contexts um, for not only the products that they serve, um, but also for um, the specific tastes of the people that are there, right? Understanding that like you are not going to serve um, a pork rib um, in Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and so like that kind of context is I think really important from an algorithmic perspective because it offers up the ability to actually give more access and give more capabilities to more people um, through technological means, but also be particularly understanding of the cultural context in which people are engaging with the products that these companies have created. Right. And understanding that discrimination is real. If you're engaging in a content moderation discussion, right, um, understanding that the voices of black people and marginalized communities are always being attacked online. Right. Particularly along the lines of voter disinformation, misinformation. Right. Understanding why that context is important when you're engaging and have a social media platform is, I think, just kind of like table stakes for understanding how your platform works within the context of elections, both past and present and how different, uh, different actors will definitely look at those platforms and try to engage those platforms and try to engage those users because at the end of the day, it means that they can control a much broader political process than just the vote itself or that particular election. It means they have much more power when they can control that or change these narratives, even by a percentage point or two. And so like understanding that process and understanding the kind of data that under that belies those processes or the data that that makes up those systems is incredibly important uh, for platforms to understand across the board, not only just for social media, but also when it comes to um, housing, employment, credit, education, lending, so on and so forth. These are all contexts that shape the entire framework of our society. And that when we kind of go into that with an understanding of what is happening at the at a cultural level, but also understand it from the framework of this is technology that should be giving people more rights, not denying people access and opportunity, then we actually have a way forward uh, with these companies and with these technologies that is one that includes marginalized communities in the future, not takes them out of it. Yeah, this is an interesting discussion because I think what we recognize when we see it and, and, and some would even say uh, offer um, solutions or, or remedies is when it's extreme, extreme harms, you know, the proverbial, you know, you don't, you know, yell fire and you, 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 that, that, that part is, is, is really clear. It's the, the, the on off ramps to that. It's the, the segue into that. It's where, you know, the conversations are very hard. Um, conversations take very imperfect conversations take place um, because I'm come from the school. I don't want to wait to present in terms of what the problem is. I want to try to, um, you know, eradicate or address it uh, before it becomes, you know, critical. But that's where the problem and where the tensions are, uh, because there is not wholesale agreement as to when we should say, here's the yellow sign, you know, here's the yield sign. We need to course correct. 
Um, and, and so Attorney Lee and uh, Dr. Lee, <laughs> you know, um, you know, they will have, um, you know, probably more uh, concrete answers. I have more questions at this juncture than answers uh, uh, because um, I am not sure when the when, the how, the collective who is, who needs, you know, in terms of who needs the, the, the seats at the table, that needs to be wide and, and, and inclusive. Um, but it, it's not as easy as the rest of us can, you know, you know, cobble words together. Um, and there are so many shades of grays and, um, you know, other, other hues um, that are, will always, uh, uh, we'll never get to Nirvana, um, but how do we get closer to it to protect, but enable in terms of our rights uh, to free speech um, and, and access to information. And honestly, our right to be wrong as heck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've got a right to be wrong as heck, <laughs> you know? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to, um, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. V, um, pass it on to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lee. I right. just wanted to rhyme there. <laughs> There's so many leads on here. Bert and I are not brother and sister, though. We could probably be <laughs> cousins, but we're not brother and sister. So, <laughs> right. So the key thing is, I, I think where we're you're talking about misinformation, it's been such an interesting area. It's a space that I look at. You know, you all know I got so many other spaces to actually delve into, and there are great experts like Bert on this call that are actually working on this. I'm excited about generational uh, transfer. So very excited that Joy put us all together. There's a lot in here that's even unspoken. But one of the things that I think is interesting about misinformation is the fact that, first and foremost, it plays off the previous exploitative, manipulative um, legacies that we've had. So the reason that in 2016 that the voter suppression happened online is because foreign operatives sort of knew the type of vulnerability that we had as a democracy in our society. And Dr. Renee Cummings at the University of Virginia, I say this in every panel and I'm going to say it again. She talks about, when we talk about data quality, the traumatizing nature of the data that is used and fed into these machines. It's called traumatized data sets. Those data sets come with the history that we have had sociologically, historically, economically, politically, that have disenfranchised us. And these systems are trained on that. And they train in misinformation systems to actually exploit those considerations. You know, people who are not necessarily the healthiest people, quote unquote, because they don't realize that we live in communities that are dense in housing or we have poor access to quality care or we just don't trust based on the historical legacies of the Tuskegee experiment and the Henrietta Lacks. But in the COVID scenario, people play off of that because that is what is known in our democracy, particularly how they treat historically disadvantaged populations. So I think the important factor that we have to recognize that makes it harder to Commissioner Clyburn's point is that it's very hard for us to unpack disinformation and misinformation because it's deeply embedded in these opaque systems, first and foremost. So it's trying to understand, it's like going to the bottom of the ocean without any scuba dive equipment and going further than the threshold because the deeper you go, the harder it is to unpack what's causing what from a technical cadence perspective and primarily from a policy perspective. But I do think to Commissioner Clyburn's uh, response, one thing that we should do and we should demand is lawful compliance with our civil rights regime, at least. If we start there, then when we had our vote suppressed, uh, technology suppressed our vote back in 2016, we might have had recourse uh, under the Voting Rights Act, right? If we understood, like uh, Bert was talking about, all these rejections when it comes to loans and when it comes to poor appraisals, we'd be able to rely upon the Fair Housing Act. I think organizations like the Urban League, the National Fair Housing Alliance, and others are starting to pique their interest on the flexibility of our civil rights regime that applied at one point to Woolworth counters to this new digital ecosystem. And I honestly believe that that may help us reel in some of the misinformation and disinformation in our communities. Because in other words, it becomes sort of the plagiarism or the berating of our communities that are not lawfully compliant. If there's nothing else we take from this, um, that analog or the legacy challenges, yes. um, the good and bad of it, uh, that's the constant. The yes. platforms, um, you know, the evolution um, is allowing things to be more efficient, efficiently, um, better efficiently or effectively worse. And so we, we can't um, look at um, connectivity in these tools and the rest and saying it's going to fix it. That's not what's broken. 
quite frankly. And, and, and I think, again, if there's nothing else you take from this, uh, we've got to go back to the old fashioned legacy on the ground, the seedling um, is, is what, you know, we, we need to spend our time, um, you know, recalibrating and, 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 and recultivating um, and, 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 and uh, refertilizing. Um, you know, that's where, uh, you know, that's where the change will come. Because if we get that part right, um, the technology is, is going to amplify it. It's going to make it more ubiquitous. Um, uh, again, for good or, I always say, you know, these tools that we're talking about, these platforms we're talking about, they're agnostic. I'm a Southern girl that, that goes to church every time she gets, but I will use the word agnostic here without hesitation. But look, if we don't get the basis right. We don't get the foundation right. Uh, technology will either um, um, cause it to be built or, or, or grown stronger, or we'll get quicker for it, you know, for it to uh, crumble. And, and I know that sounds extreme, but it is, it, it, it is foundationally and at its core. That's the issue here. That's right. I mean, so traumatized I, or healed, right? <laughs> traumatized or healed. So actually, I want to be, I want to take um, what Commissioner Clyburn, I'm sorry, Lisa, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to see the mic in just one quick second, but just a 30 minute, 30, not 30 minute, 30 second Ooh. case. I was going to say 30 um, minutes, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> A 30-second case for why this is actually in the best interest of industry. Because the world is not monolithic. The world is not white. It's not black. It is not solely Latino. It is not Asian. It is not Pacific Islander, right? The world is a conglomerate of these diverse people that make it, right? And the more that technology can be sensitive to the particularities of, of people who have been historically discriminated against across the world, not just in America, but across the world, then we can actually do a better job of making technology that works for more people. And that is, I think, the, the window that we have, I think, in the next 10 years. Because the technology is not too far advanced where we can't fix it, but it is accelerating fast enough that we may reach a point of no return, particularly with how data sets are being used, particularly with how um, companies are treating marginalized communities, particularly along the historic discrimination line. These algorithmic systems are continuing to learn at such a rapid pace from these historical data sets that did not have diversity in mind when they were created. Rather, they had a monolithic experience of not only America, but the world from a Western European perspective, because those were the America and Western Europe were some of the first countries to be able to get access to the internet, to have these data systems um, digitized in a way that is computer readable not necessarily from the standpoint of being able to say what is an inclusive world when it comes to digital access, algorithmic access, data sets, uh, machine learning, um, algorithmic decision making across the board. And so I think this is, this is an opportunity for industry and this moment is an opportunity for industry to be, to think about what does uh, not compliance look like, but what does encapsulating the spirit of inclusion from the Human Rights Commission to civil rights law look like? And how do you go above that in order to make technologies that work for more people across the globe? Because if you engage the, human, the Commission on Human Rights, uh, civil rights law, they all talk. They're coming from the exact same place of inclusion, of diversity, of in making sure that people have every chance and opportunity to succeed. And I think when technology companies engage with technology in the, from that lens, it actually makes the technology not only more profitable and uh, the ability to share it across um, a broader spectrum of the world, but also it makes it so that you're not alienating potential clients and potential users, potential um, business partners from the get-go. Instead, it has already at least tried to encapsulate or tried to think about a diversity of people from across the world, from a diversity of languages, um, sexual orientations, uh, religions, um, ages, um, and races, and, and color, of course, right? All of these things that are protected within the context of current civil rights law, but actually is something that's representative of the world broadly. That was a powerful 30 seconds. <laughs> Go ahead, so, 
<laughs> Let's shift gears. I'm sure the tweets are rolling in right now uh, with you all. Um, but let's shift gears um, just slightly and talk about inclusion, specifically digital inclusion. So I know all of you on this call have worked on issues of closing the digital divide. Um, earlier, Commissioner Clyburn was talking about the kind of different aspects of the digital divide, people having access to the actual infrastructure, people being able to afford a connection, afford the devices, or even have the digital skills they need to navigate the internet safely. So what progress have we made in closing the digital divide? And Commissioner Clyburn, I'm gonna start with you here uh, uh, since you were at the, the FCC working on this issue. So when it comes to connecting rural Americas, I, I think we've done a pretty decent job, a better than a decent job, uh, because the, the focus has been especially there. Uh, numerically, it is true that more um, people in um, urban and suburban communities by way of numbers um, uh, you know, have you know, challenges, uh, but in terms of land mass and, and uh, proportionally, uh, you know, rural America uh, has spoken. It is well represented in the Congress, so it has gotten a lot of attention. So there have been, um, you know, to, to me, you know, a great strides when it comes to the schools and libraries program and, you know, the, the equalization there. Um, uh, we haven't done well by way of Lifeline, which would, uh, you know, provide more mobile and other opportunities, particularly in, in non-rural areas. But for the most part, um, I think we've done a, a pretty more than fair job um, of, um, of connecting and empowering our communities. Where we haven't um, is where I think the most chronically uh, vulnerable uh, live um, and, and where the needs are. We have not recognized or, or have not honestly, um, you know, provided the, the, the uh, disruptive tools from a regulatory point of view, um, you know, to, to recognize the power of connecting, um, you know, those in urban areas. Uh, of, of line, aligning um, their needs in terms of health, educational, and alike. We should have never gotten caught by COVID uh, with, with, with these vulnerabilities. Let me just say it. We should have never gotten caught without connecting children in rural and urban areas. We should have never, that should have never been the problem. Um, we should have never gotten caught uh, uh, with those seniors and, and, and others who are, are, are clinically uh, vulnerable um, to not have um, online solutions uh, for uh, their care. We should have never gotten caught. And so, you know, that is, um, you know, the reality, but, you know, that not only do we need to continue to uh, course correct, but we need to be innovative and push ourselves out of the legacy decision-making, and I'm coming from a regulatory point of view, we need to do better as regulators of, uh, you, know, of you know, reading the room, of recognizing where innovation should flow. And a lot of this, I'm gonna say, you know, is looking in the mirror, looking in that regulatory mirror, looking at that legislative mirror and stop listening to the same people, stop um, funding the same uh, companies and tools um, I, I know I might work for one or two, but we need to stop exclusively doing certain things in, in certain ways. Um, that's the only way that we're going to be, um, you know, more inclusive in terms of uh, really addressing uh, these persistent poverty, these persistent healthcare, these persistent educational challenges that we have. We've got to do it differently and different, to listen to different people and have a broad and wide table with people who look like me and you there, not pulling up a chair, but firmly cemented um, you know, with a place at that table. Definitely. And we know that in America, there's about 47 million Americans who don't have broadband simply because they can't afford it. So Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, if you wanna chat with us a little bit about broadband adoption and affordability and what kind of gaps still exist there. Well, we know that we have those gaps and I, you know, coming from someone who just left the commission, I know that you are very clear, particularly with your previous boss, Commissioner Starks, that this is a reality of affordability that despite what we would like to say about it, that people still struggle with. They have to make choices between broadband and bread. And those decisions are not easy. And thankfully, we have the emergency broadband benefit, which to this date has connected 10 million people, which Commissioner Clyburn can understand. We had Lifeline, which was actually $9.25. And the uptake of that was less than 40% of the entire budget under the Universal Service Fund. And now we have the emergency broadband benefit, which came out of the pandemic response, 
We had 10 million people within a matter of a few months. That suggests to me that we've never made broadband the social safety net that people need, much like we do with electricity and heat through the low income heating and energy assistance program. What we basically did was we put that out as a social safety support and safety net for people who know they need to be connected. Let's just be real clear, but do not have the means to make those kind of decisions when it comes to limited income. I would also say that there is a promise. We've got a $65 billion down payment on broadband, the biggest I've ever seen in my life. I can say that definitively because I was, as when I was working in the nonprofit sector, I was a top recipient of the first broadband program and the second broadband program. So I know what it's like to actually have money on the table. The last time that we had a huge investment was through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And it was a quarter of what we actually have right now. The question becomes in this allocation that's going towards deployment and affordability and digital equity, how is that going to line up with the numbers? We know we have a lot of money when it comes to deployment. As Commissioner said, a lot of money is going to go towards rural deployment. We got to make sure that it goes to Black and Hispanic rural deployment, tribal lands, not just those places that people want to visit as tourists, but where people are living, where they need a lifeline to jobs and other opportunities like the commissioner said 50 million school age kids were sent home, 15 to 16 million of them didn't have broadband. And guess what? Now we're suffering an educational regression because those kids were not able to learn. The second thing with the affordability program, we're moving out of the emergency broadband benefit into the affordability connect affordable connectivity program. That program is going to reduce the benefit for broadband service from 50 to $30 per month, but it still has a hundred dollar incentive for hardware. We need more people to take advantage of that. I think the more that we can actually share that program, not just with the usual suspects as the commissioner said, but really getting out to the community health clinics. Every place that we want people to have access to broadband should have a flyer or something on their desk for families to actually know about that. We talked about that 20 years ago, remember commissioner, when it came to ensuring that we asked that question when people were recertifying for public housing. And then I would say third, the smallest of the pot is digital equity. And I would suggest that we still have a proportion of people that are just not interested or not knowing how to get online. My mother being one of them. She's uh, older don't in out, age. Don't out my friend. Do not out I know, my I friend. Have to her. She didn't tell her health. And at one point she had the camera backwards. The doctor couldn't see it for a long time. Stop. We have to make sure that we actually train people not just on digital readiness like the Lewis Latimer plan is proposing, but we also have to make sure that people are trustworthy of the technology that they're being exposed to. And I think that's Bert's uh, point there. We don't want to push Black people online if they only get exploited or further manipulated. We want them to come online because we know, as the commissioner said early on, that analog has, is basically dissolving and obliterating itself. But more importantly, we know that the lifeline to the next generation of social mobility opportunities rests in your ability to be connected. I don't care what people say. And those young people actually went online for school and it was painful. I had a couple at home. They learned new skills for the 21st century economy, how to work collaboratively, independently, how to actually get a job where you're not working in low wage work, but you're actually able to work in an environment that may be remote. We have to keep reminding ourselves that we don't want the scraps when it comes to this broadband investment that the United States has taken on. We actually want to be in the center. And I think that goes to who are the people that have the lived experiences of the communities that we have, that were resilient during this pandemic, those teachers and superintendents and churches and business owners that can actually speak to better ways to allocate that money. So I wanna put that out there because I think a lot of folks don't understand what's at stake. And the only way you're gonna have a seat at the table is you gotta go talk to your state broadband commissions and let them know that you exist. So I, I'm glad you went there, Dr. Lee, because I was going to say, um, when after this conference is over, you have a charge to your affiliates and you it. because there are a lot of this basic hardcore long term decisions, um, because a lot of these monies are going into block grant form to these states. So if, if you're not, um, you know, regardless of, you know, you might not cover the whole state the affiliate might be in one you know, you know, one city, but the one or two uh, affiliates in that state or the one affiliate has to be the voice of the entire state in terms of, um, you know, that inclusion. I don't care what proportion of that part um, is equity. No, it's not enough, you know, that, that is aligned with these issues. The entire pie 
needs to be equitably distributed. Um, and um, it is not going to happen if we sit on the sidelines and whine. We have to be in those rooms, challenge, and we're gonna lose a couple of battles, but we cannot go so quietly in that good day and night. We cannot afford to do that. And so it is really important and, and um, you know, to continue to help your affiliates because I think your affiliates are going to be more important than ever to get this word out and to be that um, you know, continual beacon uh, you know, for, these mes for this messaging. That's right. And if I can on that, I, I love the way you're bringing it up because I think all of us on this call, this has been like our recent charge. If you're an affiliate listening to this and you're trying to do workforce development and you want to improve upon your digital literacy activities because you're teaching computer skills or you're trying to show people how to do coding, you need to make sure that you are somehow listed in the plans that your state is developing. Find out going to the website for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, who runs your state broadband authority? And then say, I am a National Urban League affiliate and I'm doing this work because you don't want the broadband to pass you by. Or if you're working with seniors and you want to make sure that they have access to telehealth, there is money in the digital equities part of this for you to get iPads or tablets or something to be able to maintain an always on connection. The key thing is when the money is gone, just like my family tells me, it's gone. <laughs> so it's important to get a seat at the table. We need as many partners to come to the table to some of the state leaders who are gonna make decisions on the allocations because the money is there and it's being prepared to be uh, sorted out. Thank you. And we could not foot stomp that enough. We definitely need our affiliates to be funded. We need them to have the tools to be able to reach these communities because they are the folks who are working on the ground and they're trusted. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this panel up. This has been a great discussion. I'm going to give everyone 10 to 15 seconds to make your last point. What do you want to leave our audience with today? So Bert, we are going to start with you 10 to 15 seconds. Changing the framework of algorithmic decision-making and artificial intelligence systems to one to give more people opportunities as opposed to denying people access is going to be the most critical thing we can do moving forward, um, both from a regulatory perspective and from a legislative perspective. Thank you. Dr. Turner Lee. Technology is transformative until you are the product or the subject. And do not be an attribute of the technology. I think what we've talked about today is figure out how to be a producer. Of it. Definitely. And Commissioner Clyburn. We have spoken about a lot of challenges, you know, a lot of things that are not ideal in our community. But I'm here to say to you that every single thing we have highlighted is fixable. And what is so promising about this moment through leveraging technology and, and the drive that we have and being connected will ensure that those fixes would come quicker. So keep, stay encouraged, um, you know, stay focused, but know that there is a fix, there is a solution at the end of this technology rainbow and it takes you, uh, you we need you to ensure that that happens. Thank you again to our panelists. We've reserved the last word for a special guest who brings necessary insight and perspective to this discussion. Please welcome my former boss, FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the National Urban League for inviting me to speak at this year's Legislative Policy Conference and for convening us on such an important topic, tech literacy and how it is essentially intertwined in our movement on civil rights and economic justice. But let's start at the beginning. John Lewis once said, access to the internet is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. That's a pretty good start. And this isn't the first time the National Urban League and I have partnered on this theme. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mayor Morial and I teamed up with other civil rights leaders to write a call to action entitled, Broadband Access is a Civil Right We Can't Afford to Lose, But Many Can't Afford to Have. And last year, I contributed to the National Urban League's State of Black America, discussing how access to the internet is inextricably linked to economic opportunity, remote learning for our community's children, and better telehealth care for all. So don't let anyone say that we haven't been running point on these messages for years. Digital skills are essential to our movement. Powerful tools necessary for effective advocacy and organizing in the 21st century. 
In 2020, the video of George Floyd that affected so many of us was captured on a cell phone and uploaded to social media by an incredibly brave teenager, Darnella Frazier. The movement and demands for justice that follow relied on the internet and other digital resources to spread information on organized efforts calling for justice and change. Without access to these resources, those voices would never have been heard. Their efforts would not have been amplified. We need to harness the power of these tools, make them accessible in every community, and spread the digital skills needed to wield them. At the FCC, I am laser focused on providing access to high quality, affordable broadband for all. The future we are building today must be defined by equity so that all can compete and succeed in the digital age. The good news is that I think we're on the right path. In wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress recognized the considerable and urgent need for affordable broadband for all. The Affordable Connectivity Program, which began as a pandemic response program, is now a long-term $14 billion program offering millions of Americans support in providing internet access to their homes. We're also reaching every American uh, through Congress's investment in $42 billion that NTIA will spend on communications infrastructure through its Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, BEAD. Taken together, these programs represent a once-in-a-generation investment in broadband equity. This is the time. Now is the moment to meet our disconnected where they are. We have to take note that nearly 42% of American seniors lack a broadband connection at home. Digital skills and a lack of access to devices play a significant role in these very low rates. We have got to do better. And in many ways, our seniors are the pillars of the black community, storing our most meaningful, meaningful moments, dispensing wisdom at the critical time and guiding us along the right path. And I've seen the spark in the eyes of a senior who finally gets connected for the first time. And I've also seen the young teaching the old, building those bonds of support, strengthening our tradition and culture. That is the true nature of community. We're all stronger when we're all connected. I look forward to continuing this work alongside the National Urban League. Thank you again for bringing us together and to all of you for our shared collective work in closing the digital divide in our community. Everyone be safe and be well. Thank you, Commissioner Starks. And that's how we did it. And that's a wrap for our panel. We look forward to seeing you at our next session. Good afternoon, Urban Leaguers. It's Joy Cheney again, Executive Director of the Washington Bureau and Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at Your Urban League, which fights for you. Look, I had the privilege to moderate the first uh, panel of this session yesterday, and I have the privilege of moderating the last session. We have finally hit out from under ending the crushing burden of student loan debt. And we have a powerhouse line up for you today, beginning with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Now look, we had originally planned for us all to be talking at the same time, but 
Congresswoman Presley has a vote schedule and we all know, having watched this panel for two whole days, we know that Congress is always ups and downs and crazy and chimes are changing. And we know that she has important work today, especially on gun violence. She's doing great work. She's also been doing great work on student loan and student loan debt cancellation. And so we are so privileged to have her with us today. And then we'll go into our panel and ultimately we'll get to your questions. Congresswoman Presley, I'm gonna invite you on. We are so thankful to have you here uh, representing Congress and this issue. Uh, and thank you on behalf of the Urban League. Congresswoman. Thank you, Joy. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, I look forward to the day when we can be in the beloved community together in person. But I appreciate the opportunity to join all of you uh, virtually for this critical conversation. I do want to thank uh, the National Urban League for uh, creating this town hall and intentionally creating space specifically to uh, uplift the issue of student debt uh, and to center the disparate impact that the student debt crisis, which is nearly a two trillion dollar crisis, has had on Black America. Now, a lot of people are unaware of that, mostly because for too long we've been excluded from the narrative. And so people are, uh, although they were feeling the burden, uh, the public narrative was excluding our stories. And um, really, this is just exacerbating racial and economic inequities, compounding our gender and racial wealth gap. So it's really long past time that uh, we tackle this $1.7 trillion student debt loan crisis and tackle it as the racial and economic justice issue that it is. Uh, there is not a room, a Zoom room, uh, or in community uh, that I enter uh, where someone is not stopping me about this issue. Uh, and again, the, the uh, public narrative, although we've put in some great work uh, these last couple of years to diversify it in order to tell the full story of this crisis. I quite literally um, have 76 year olds in my district who are still paying uh, on student loans. Uh, I have so many parents, overwhelmingly black parents who've taken out parent plus loans who are in their upper 60s who want to retire and they can't because they're still paying on their children's loans. And of course, we have a whole generation uh, that is choked and burdened uh, by this debt that cannot uh, start a family, grow a family, uh, purchase a home, uh, or start a business. So this is a, a intergenerational crisis. It is an economic justice issue. It is a racial justice issue, and it's a gender justice issue, given the disparate, disparate impact of this debt uh, on women and on Black women in particular. Uh, and this is layered on top of what I would consider uh, generations of very precise and intentional policy violence because it's important that we recognize that the reason why Black students borrow at higher rates uh, is out of necessity. Uh, one, the cost of higher education has increased by 150%. And then secondly, uh, because of a policy uh, violence like redlining, our families were uh, denied the ability to build generational wealth. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been great strides that have been made, uh, certainly there have been many strides, but income is not wealth. Income is not wealth. So again, because mo many of our families were not afforded the opportunity to build generational wealth, uh, we borrow at higher rates and we also uh, default at higher rates. And that's simply for a chance at the same degree um, as our white peers. And as black women, again, we bear the heaviest burden on average. We owe more than $41,000. That's 22% more than the average student let loan debt owed by our white counterparts. So when you layer that with the fact that we're forced to navigate lingering workplace discrimination, a persistent wage gap, that to this day in 2022 allows us to earn just 61 cents to every dollar earned by a white man. So this crisis is not naturally occurring. It is why I say policy is my love language because inequities and disparities and racial injustices, heart and harm have been codified in our laws. And so I do believe that we can legislate uh, equity. We can legislate economic justice and freedom. Uh, we can legislate 
uh, healing. And this is a policy choice. We can do something about this. We can undo the hurt and harm of discriminatory policies like redlining, again, which denied our families the ability to build generational wealth. Uh, there were policy choices that were made during the last financial crisis when policymakers bailed out Wall Street and abandoned Black communities who lost everything, what wealth we, we might have had left, we lost there. And it's policy choices that have resulted in the chronic underfunding of our historically Black colleges and universities, our community colleges, our state public universities, resulting in skyrocketing tuition and pushing a college degree far out of reach for too many. And again, just to uplift that this is a racial justice issue, we know that the needs of our HBCUs, uh, which have been woefully and chronically underfunded, but they use ARPA funds. We, we see the presidents of HBCUs um, outpacing the federal government uh, in this moment. And out of all the needs they have and all the ways that those funds from the American Rescue Plan could have been used, they chose to use it to cancel student, get, student debt. So again, this is a racial justice issue. But we are closer than ever before. This movement has only continued to become more uh, emboldened, uh, more uh, diversified, and has just grown. And, and thanks to the relentless organizing and movement builders across the nation, President Biden chose to use the authority that was granted to him by Congress, actually, under the Higher Education Act, to offer financial relief to millions of federal student loan borrowers by extending the pause on student loan payments, not once, not twice, three times during this pandemic, three times. And I've heard from people who use those monies that were saved during this pandemic to remain safely housed, to purchase essential goods. And I even met some black folks who became first generation homeowners. So if that's the sort of transformational impact that we can see in people's lives and in the lives of black America in just a two year period, imagine how meaningful, impactful, transformative if we are able to see student debt cancellation by executive action at $50,000. So again, it was a policy choice that recognized the crushing burden this debt was having on millions of workers and families in the midst of this ongoing pandemic. So using the same authority, because I know there's been some debate about whether or not uh, the president, in fact, has the authority, the same authority that was used to pause those student loan payments. The administration has another opportunity to stand on the right side of history and cancel student debt, alleviate this burden, executive action with the stroke of a pen. So doing so is one of the most effective ways to provide sweeping relief to millions of workers and families across the nation. Doing so would help repair generations of hurt and harm imposed on black communities. It would help reduce the racial wealth gap. If we do it at $50,000, it'll reduce the racial wealth gap, economists say, by 30%. This is also an effective uh, strategy of recovery from this pandemic-induced recession. It'll jumpstart and boost our economy set the groundwork for a just and equitable recovery and leave no one behind. And perhaps most importantly, canceling student debt would not require one single vote in Congress. This is something that can be done unilaterally. So in this moment, our communities deserve and demand this sort of bold, transformative, meaningful response. Student debt cancellation is core to any effort to build an equitable recovery from this pandemic. Student debt cancellation, let me just say this loudly, is not charity. We're not asking for benevolence or charity. It's reciprocity. This is being responsive to the needs of the coalition of voters which made this democratic majority possible. Now, over the last several months, the Biden administration has announced $25 billion in loan relief since January of last year, including long overdue relief for thousands of borrowers who were scammed by for-profit Corinthian colleges. So this is historic and shows just how meaningful debt relief will be to our community that has bore this brunt for far too long. We can and we must build on this momentum with executive debt cancellation that will repair the generations of harm caused by this unjust system. But let me be clear, we cannot stop there because we have got to address those deeper issues which result in the high need to take all these loans. So we have to address the skyrocketing cost of college, which has been driven by decades of state and federal divestment. We have got to invest 
in education as the public good that it is. We can and we must invest in our HBCUs, financial aid programs like the Pell Grant to ensure that more of our families can afford a college degree without taking on debt to begin with. And we need tuition-free community college and to build a student loan system that is just and equitable for the next generation of borrowers. Nothing is off the table except in action. And as I close, as someone uh, who lives out the statistical data here, you know, I took out loans, raised in a single parent household first in my family to uh, go to college, and I defaulted on those loans. And it was decades, uh, shortly before even my arriving in Congress, that I was finally able to pay those loans off. And it was not for any lack of uh, wantonness or responsibility. I was working multiple jobs. I simply could not get ahead. And I carried great shame about that debt. So when we talk about uh, how crippling this is, it, it's not just for all the ways in which it, it handicaps and hampers us in having true economic freedom, um, but it takes a psychological toll. And we have the, um, the tool to alleviate this burden, to lighten people's loads, and we have to go as broad and as deep as the hurt is. We must deliver and we are closer than ever to getting this done. Thank you so much again uh, for the opportunity to say a few words. I hope that the vote schedule will allow me to pop back in. Uh, but, yes. if not, but if not, uh, Joy, thank you once again. Thank you to the National Urban League. And thank you to all of you for joining this critical conversation. I also hope you will join us in this broader movement. Congresswoman, thank you so much. Massachusetts 7th District is well represented in you and indeed the entire nation is. We wanna thank you for joining us. If you can join us later after votes for question and A, we will certainly take you. But if not, we appreciate everything, not just that you've done already, but that you're going to do on behalf of Americans, including student loan borrowers and on so many other issues. We appreciate having you. All right, colleagues. So. We are so excited uh, to have this panel. All of the things that the Congresswoman talked about, we are gonna address during this session. We're gonna talk about student loan debt cancellation, but we're also gonna talk about how we can lower the cost of student loan borrowing and the cost of college writ large. We wanna make sure this is comprehensive. So no matter where you fall, we wanna have some solutions for you. And we hope to be able to take some questions uh, when you come back so that we can have a conversation about technical assistance that you might need in accessing some of the programs that the Biden-Harris administration have put out there. We are so lucky later on, we will be joined by our guild and our young professional members who have some questions for our panelists and me and maybe if Congresswoman Presley is able to come back. First, I wanna go ahead and I wanna throw it to um, Mark Morial, who a couple of weeks ago, we had the privilege of honoring Congresswoman Presley with one of our Congressional uh, Champion Awards. And Mark was so privileged and excited to be able to present her with the award. And we're gonna hear from her again, her pre-taped remarks where she accepted it. And then we'll have the chairman uh, of the committee that deals with all of these issues in the Congress on for remarks as well. So with that, I would love to kick it to Mark. Thank you. I am honored to present our final National Urban League 2022 Congressional Champion Award to the esteemed history-making representative from the great state of Massachusetts, Ayanna Presley. Now she's only in her second term, but she's already distinguished herself as an activist and policymaker who is passionately committed to the marginalized and underserved. As she has said eloquently, the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. It's a worldview born of our own hardships. And that passion has vaulted her to the forefront of issues that matter to Americans who are struggling. Among them, the 45 million Americans drowning in student debt. No one has spoken more forcefully or with greater personal knowledge about the student loan crisis and its crippling economic impact on the lives of so many Americans than Ayanna Presley. It's acute in the black community where bottomless debt 
and a constant threat of default can permanently block paths to home ownership, career opportunities, and financial stability. The Congresswoman consistently speaks truth to power on this issue, and she's called on the president and her colleagues in the legislature to cancel student debt and recognize how Black Americans suffer disproportionately under a broken system. We stand with Representative Presley in her efforts to unburden the millions fighting for their piece of the dream from perpetual oppressive debt. And we honor her for her unwavering dedication to the nation's underserved and underrepresented. It is therefore with great honor and pleasure that I present a National Urban League 2022 Congressional Champion Award to Representative Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts. Hello, family. What a joy and an honor it is to be in community with you, albeit virtually, and certainly a humbling honor to be the recipient of your Congressional Champion Award. Thank you to President and CEO Mark Morial for your leadership during these incredibly trying and unprecedented times for our nation. And of course, I want to thank the leadership at my local branch, the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts, for their continued partnership, laboring in love and sweat equity on behalf of our communities. We are so very blessed to have President Dr. Keith Motley and Chairman Joe Feaster in their roles. And I'm lucky to be able to call them both mentors and friends. The Urban League's leadership and moral clarity is needed now more than ever. White supremacist violence continues to threaten the lives and well being of Black and Brown communities, compounding the deep structural inequities and the perpetual underinvestment and erosion of our collective civil rights. It is long past time that we legislate healing, that we legislate justice, that we legislate equity, that we legislate with the humanity and dignity of Black Americans at the center. I'm so grateful for the progress that we have made together collectively to address the nearly $1.7 trillion crisis that is student debt. And of course, student debt and its cancellation is a racial, economic, and intergenerational justice issue. It is an economic policy that will change the lives of millions of families. And it will create opportunities for families to invest in themselves and future generations. I accept this award today, uh, not only for the work that we have already done, to effectively advocate and to uh, elevate our challenges. But the work we must continue to do together to make justice in every form a reality for Black America. Thank you to the Urban League for your continued partnership. The blueprint is clear. When we organize and mobilize, we can empower Black and Brown families to actualize our full potential and to live the lives we deserve. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Bobby Scott of Virginia's third district and I chair the House Committee on Education and Labor. Thank you to the Urban League for including me in this year's program and for all you do to support students, families and workers. We all know the value of a college education. When implemented properly, student loan programs can provide the resources that people need to earn a college degree while also offering a pathway to repayment or forgiveness that meets their needs. However, over the past few years, it has become clear that our student loan system is falling short of its promise to students. That's why the Biden administration has forgiven more than $17 billion in student debt for 725,000 borrowers and work to ensure that our student loan program puts borrowers' needs first. These steps included providing $1.9 billion in relief to 100,000 borrowers who are defrauded by their institutions, discharging the loans of over 350,000 borrowers who have a total and permanent disability, improving access to income-driven repayment for millions of borrowers, and pausing payments interest accrual and collections for all student loans during the COVID-19 pandemic. Simply put, since the start of COVID-19, 
borrowers have been spared from making any payments on their student loans or accruing interest on them. Importantly, the administration has also improved the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, PSLF, which, is pre which the previous administration did not faithfully implement. In fact, in 2019, the Government Accountability Office found that the Department of Education under the Trump administration denied roughly 99% of PSLF applicants. The Student Service Loan Forgiveness Program was not designed to be a puzzle or a contest. It was designed as a tool to recruit talented people into public service and recognize their contributions to our communities. The Department of Education announced major reforms last October that have expanded borrowers' access to PSLF. As a result, approximately $6.8 billion in debt, covering more than 100,000 loans, have already been forgiven. This is an historic step in the right direction. However, we know that there's more work to be done to ensure that every student can reap the lifelong benefits of a high quality education. And as chair of the Education and Labor Committee, I remain committed to securing the core provisions of the College Affordability Act, which was considered but not passed in the last Congress, and addressing loan forgiveness, the length of time for repayment, challenging interest rates, and even significant increase in Pell Grants. I also look forward to hearing more from the administration about additional changes they are considering to make a more equitable and effective student loan program. So thank you again for all that you do and thank you for including me in this year's program. Welcome back. Thank you again to Representative Bobby Scott representing Virginia's third district. He is the powerful chairman of the Committee on Education and Labor. And frankly, all of the work that we've been talking about on student loans is centered and housed in his committee. Now we have two other powerhouse women uh, to echo many of the things that Congresswoman Ayanna Presley was already saying. I wanna welcome to our stage here, our panel, um, my good friend, Ashley Harrington, Federal Advocacy Director and Senior Policy Advisor at the Center for Responsible Lending. Hi, Ashley. And my uh, sister in the Urban League, Michelle Merriweather. She is the President and CEO of the Urban League of Metropolitan Washington. Uh, she's a good friend, a tried and true Urban Leaguer, and one of our younger uh, presidents and CEOs of an Urban League affiliate. Uh, and so she is leading and we are so glad to have her. And I think you all know that we will have members of our young professionals, uh, as well as Shaladin Hollingshed, who's the president of our young professionals, as well as the president of our guild, uh, the other Bobby Scott, and he'll probably get me for calling him the other Bobby Scott. Uh, we are so glad to have all of you on. Uh, Michelle and Ashley, we heard from the Congresswoman and, you know, really, I was thinking about when she was speaking one of the tweets that she made last year, when we were sort of beginning this, um, this student loan debt cancellation debate. And she said, I'm gonna look down and read it. You want to thank black women? Cancel student debt. All of it. Black women carry more student debt than any other group in America. Save your words of appreciation. Policy is our love language. I cannot think of better words <laughs> to kick off this all-female panel on student loan debt relief. We know it's not just Black women that hold debt relief, but um, we certainly hold a lot of it. And it's really important. Um, it's a gender justice, it's a racial justice, it's an economic justice issue. And so we're so glad to have both of you on. Um, one of the things I wanted to, you know, to talk about as we began, um, you know, Ashley. This, the Biden-Harris administration has been getting a, a lot of attention lately. And I won't ask you to, to say anything that you shouldn't, but I want people to know where you're coming from. You're not just a member of the Biden-Harris administration, a proud member of it. You've been doing the student loan work for a long time. Tell me your origin story in student loan, because this isn't the first time we've met. Uh, Ashley, prior to coming to, into the administration, was a partner of the Urban League. Tell us about it. 
Absolutely, Joy. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to the Urban League um, for having me and make sure that, um, you know, the Black voice is a part of it because we know that we are the ones that are bearing um, the biggest burden and the big and the brunt of the student debt crisis. Um, from the advocacy world, um, I was director of federal advocacy and a senior counsel at the Center for Responsible Lending. I also spent some time at UNCF, the United Negro College Fund. And, you know, I have student loans. So, Everybody, half the people I know have student loans, probably more than that. So this is something that is near and dear to my heart, to my experience, and to my work. So I came into this because, you know, this is something that is impacting the lived experience of so many people who look like me. And this thing that we have, we went, we did everything right in so many ways, right? We went to school, we went to higher ed, we went to law school, if you were me, and now we have all this debt and it was supposed to get us to that next level, into that middle-class lifestyle, right? But we have all this debt that's preventing us from actually living that. I always like to say people got middle class incomes but can't see can't live middle class lives because of their student loans. And that is absolutely the case for so many Black Americans today. And so that's how I come to this work, wanting to make that, wanting to make sure that not only we're fixing a broken system, but that we're making sure that it's working better for everyone, particularly the people who are struggling the most under a system that you know hasn't worked and and ha and has had so many issues for too long. We thank you for it. And Michelle, I'm going to ask you to do the same. Tell me what your experience is with student loans. Because in preparation for this, you told me a little bit about your personal yeah. story. And I would love to hear it because I think it reflects the experiences that all of us have. And actually, I know she did. Definitely, definitely. I, um, thank you. It's an honor to be here with you all and, and listening um, to the remarks. Um, I will say that my um, my origin story is not unique, right? I had student debt, um, and I will also say, um, since our young professionals are joining us in this conversation, I come to this work as a young professional. I may have the title of CEO now, and uh, and a, a, a probably a maybe maybe a bigger um, kind of platform to advocate and do this work. But I started out as a young professional, and almost ten years ago. I'm still claiming young professional, even though I might have aged out. But over 10 years ago, uh, we were professing that student loan debt was going to be the next kind of bubble and hot topic 10 years ago. And so maybe we were before our time, but shout out to my friend, my dear, dear friend, Travis Townsend in Atlanta, who was a visionary and started this work um, and elevating this voice for the Urban League Young Professionals almost 10 years ago. Um, so I want to start there and give a shout out to where I where this work started for me, um, and I certainly carried uh, a student loan debt, uh, and it's generational. My my parents carried student loan debt. They didn't have uh, the honor and privilege of of having. They had the honor and privilege of getting a college degree, but didn't have the um, the honor of it being paid for. Um, so once they finished paying for their own debt, they. Uh, sort of helped me out, but I also had my own debt in order to pay for my um, my degree, which I'm grateful for and certainly um, would do it again if needed. But I will say um, it, oh, it took me over 20 years to even be in a place and a position to start to pay down that principle. And further, um, which is even a harder pill to swallow, I wasn't able to pay it off until last year uh, when uh, I lost my dad and uh, he joined the ancestors. And with that, he left some money to us um, through insurance and other things that made it possible for me to pay off that debt. Um, and uh, in that, uh, I'm able to start the journey to prepare to purchase a home. So um, it has taken a long time. It has taken a lot of loss and a lot of sacrifice, um, not only for me, again, my story is not unique, um, but, you know, it's where we are as a, as a, a community. And I will tell you, um, Michelle, thank you for sharing that story. Um, and thank you to your dad, right, for thinking and planning for you in advance. And I will tell you, I too, and my husband, uh, who's on as well and screaming from the sidelines. He also, we're both playing off our student loans. And we do know that the Obamas uh, were recently having just paid off their student loans as they entered the White House. Exactly. And he was a young president, but not that young, right? Can you imagine to still be paying those student loans? And so, you know, this is such a timely conversation. 
Ashley, I want to, you know, go to you. Can you tell us, and look, this is a timely conversation. And it's also been one that was, you know, a campaign promise that we were going to address something about our student loans. Um, and so, so many people went to vote because they wanted to have relief, um, whether cancellation or just a lowered, um, some kind of addressing of the higher rising costs of um, student loan debt. Can you tell me what the administration has done in order to address this issue? Absolutely. So we're doing a lot. Um, I think, you know, I'll start with the numbers. $25 billion in relief for 1.3 million borrowers so far. That's the, the most that has been done under any administration. 560,000 borrowers who went to the Corinthian College, one of the for-profit colleges that, you know, closed years ago, like over eight years ago, uh, we are canceling the debt for 560,000 borrowers. That is the biggest group relief claim under ever under any administration, but just ever in general. So we have really prioritized targeted relief, but also making programs work better. One of the programs I'm working a lot on is public service loan forgiveness, which, you know, had a simple promise. You work in public service for 10 years. After that, you, you're making payments on your loans. After that, you get your loans forgiven. It sounded simple, but for so many borrowers, it wasn't. And coming into this administration, only 6,500 people had gotten PSLF forgiveness, even though it had started in October 2007. And so that's been over almost 15 years now. Only 6,500 people had gotten forgiveness. Because we implemented this new limited PSLF waiver, which everyone should know about, you should you have some steps you need to take by October 31st if you haven't taken them and you're in, and you're in public service and you have student loans. Because of that waiver, we have now um, uh, over 127,000 people have gotten PSLF. That's in addition to the, the more than a million people who are getting extra credit towards their 120. So they may not be getting forgiven this year, but they're gonna get forgiven that much sooner because of these changes. It's what they earned, it's what they deserve because they have been serving the public. They have been serving us for so long, even more so over the past two years during this pandemic. And so to make that program work better, we're working on changes to income-based repayment, which black and brown borrowers are more likely to rely on income-based repayment because of you know racial wealth and income disparities and, and pay disparities. We're making that work better. So people later on this year are gonna see additional credit towards income-based repayments. They'll be closer to their 20 or 25 years of forgiveness. We're, um, we announced that we're going to come out of this pandemic and do something called Fresh Start, where we put make all defaulted borrowers current and in good standing so that they can restart their lives, get back on track, and stay on track with their student loans. So there is a lot that we are doing to help student loan borrowers and to fix this system that has been so broken. So let me jump in there on the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Ashley, who is included in that? It's people who work at .org, like me. Uh, and have done so for 10 years, but it's also people who worked at .govs, right? So the government, as well as people who served in the military, is that right? Yep, so federal, state, local, tribal government, ah, okay. or military, okay. military, all 501c3 nonprofits, and some other nonprofits, if they do a qualifying public service, like emergency okay. management, public health, education, something like that. It's not, no for-profits count. So even if you're a for-profit contractor and you work in a public service setting, fortunately that doesn't count. Um, okay. So none of volunteer work doesn't count. But if you fall into any of those other categories, you, are, you count. And even if you're not at 10 years, even if you don't think you have 120 payments, go ahead and get started. Get your paperwork in so that you can at least start accruing that credit. Absolutely. Okay, so remind us again, what is the deadline for submitting your, pa your paperwork? And where should people go for more information. Okay. So the deadline for the waiver. So PSLF is not going to end in October, but the PSLF limited waiver, which is this amazing thing, which is how we get from 6,500 people to over 127,000 people in a year, right? That's how we get there is through this waiver. So to take advantage of that, even if you're not at 120, you need to consolidate if you don't have federal direct loans yet and submit at least one PSLF form. That's how you certify your public service employment. That's how Joy proves she works at NUL. That's how I prove I work at the Department of Education. I get, I go on, I go to www.studentaid.gov slash PSLF. I use the help tool. I create this form. I print it out. Yes, I print it out. I sign it. I get my employer to sign it. And then I send it in, right? 
I have to do that before October 31st of this year so I can get the maximum amount of credit towards my loans. Even if I'm not at 120, I'm not at 120, but I look at my account like once a month so I can feel like one day I might be at 120. So go ahead and get those forms in and do it by October 31st, 2022. And if you want to learn more about the waiver, studentaid.gov slash PSLF waiver. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so Michelle, let's go back to you. We've talked about the PSLF. Um, and we'll talk about income um, driven repayment in a few minutes again, but I don't want to make this y'all about the technology. I also, and the, and the technical aspects of getting in, because I also want to talk about why this is so important that we address whether it's student loan debt, debt cancellation or just the rising costs of student loans. I mean, you run an urban league affiliate and in that process, you have people who are coming to you who are trying to start a business who are trying to purchase a home, you know, how, what is the student loan debt burden? What does that do to those dreams? Yeah, it's a dream deferred or it's sometimes not even a reality. I can say that while, you know, the last two years or two and a half, however long we've been in this pandemic, uh, uh, you know, with the, uh, the, the delay of, of payment, it has been um, a, a, a lifeline for so many people that have been able uh, to purchase a home or at least have the down payment or be able to start a business or pay down some other debt or even continue to pay down their student loan payments. It's just, it's given folks freedom. I think um, that has been long overdue and so very necessary, especially over the last couple of years. Um, I will add though, um, right now it's coming back, right? And so folks are starting to get nervous again. Like, how am I going to, you know, I'm going to have to choose. I'm going to have to choose paying my mortgage or paying my student loan debt, feeding my kids or paying my student loan debt. So it's coming back while this, this, the, well, unless, you know, the things we can continue to put some things in. Place. We're going to ask Ashley, is it coming right, back? Ashley's making some things happen. Um, but, you know, so that, that fear is starting to come back and we're starting to certainly prepare for that. We have some wonderful folks and coaches at our urban league and urban leagues across the country to help folks plan, um, but that fear is starting to, to, to regenerate itself as it did um, pre-pandemic, pre-debt um, repayment uh, delay. So it has been a lifeline and I can only imagine what, uh, what could have been done if we started this sooner. Um, but you know, we're starting from where we are and it has been um, certainly a lifeline for folks. The folks that, including you know, myself, right? That have been able to prepare for home ownership, which we thought that that would never happen for so many, um, catch up on mortgages um, and pay other bills and just feed their families. I mean, really, folks have literally had to have, make the choice of going into default in, into their loans and paying for food for their families. And this has just been um, some reprieve and um, what a difference it has made. And I can only imagine uh, what it can do for the future. Absolutely. Ashley, I am going to kick it to you, not to ask if it's coming back, really. I know you can't answer that. But one of the questions, what I just wanted you to reiterate, we have extended, the administration rather, has extended um, the moratorium on student loan debt repayment due to the pandemic several times now. Can you just kind of explain how that's gone, just to make sure people know? And look, tell me what the repercussions of doing that are. So meaning, uh, it's still counting towards your payment. Just make sure everyone understands that. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Absolutely. It's, you know, the first pause was actually under the prior administration. Then it was uh, uh, codified by Congress in the CARES Act. And it has been subsequently extended multiple times under multiple administ under both administrations, most recently by the Biden administration. And like, and like uh, Michelle was saying, absolutely, it's been meaningful, right? People have, people have need needed that and have continued to need that. And they have felt the difference in their lives when they didn't have those monthly payments. That is, That has been a real game changer for so many people who has, it has put things in reach like home ownership, small business ownership, investing in themselves, saving for retirement, things that you would think that people with student loans who had pursued higher education would be able to do, it has put that within reach and it, and it has enabled people to help, it has helped them weather this pandemic, this uncertain economic times, things that continue to, that has not, it still continue to happen. It's helped so many people navigate that. So absolutely, um, it's been a game changer. But what's also really great about this time is 
for those of us who you've still managed, you know, you've been able to continue to work and keep your job and work in public service during this pandemic, during this payment pause, even though we're not required to make payments right now, you can get credit towards PSLF and income-based repayment for this time where we weren't required to make payments. I'm gonna say it again, for every single one of these 26, 27 months now that we have not been required to make a payment, if you have federal direct loans, if you also submit a PSLF form showing that, yes, you did work at the Department of Education, yes, you did work at Urban League, yes, you did work for your state government, you can get credit for every single one of those months towards your 120 payments towards PSLF. So the fifth of it, at least, should be taken care of if you've been working this whole time. And I have that to- That is People don't believe it, Joy. And I think it's how- <laughs> Like, really? How? But absolutely, you can. You can get credit for this time. Just submit your PSLF forms. Ashley, what if you've overpaid? So what if you've gone beyond your the number of months that you had to pay? Mm-hmm. What happens to that money? So when I talked about the 127,000 plus people, and that number has gone up, I think it's going to be closer to 140 soon. Um, for those people, once we implemented the waiver, so the waiver was if you had fell loans and Perkins loans, loans that were guaranteed by the federal government but not um, originated by us, and you now you could now get credit for time and repayment on those loans where you were also in public service. Um, if you missed a payment, or if your payment was late, or if it was like a little bit short, you can get credit for those months. And so we're adding in all those months of payment. That's how we get to the the hundred twenty seven thousand people, and. If we add in all those months of payment, we give you your credit and you have made more than that 120 payments on a direct loan, people are getting money back. People are literally getting money back from the federal government for their student loans. Wow. You you can't beat that, right? There because we're making the system work better and people are getting refunds of payments over 120. That's amazing. And it's a sign that your vote matters. Um, But let's go on and talk about other issues, right? Because it's not about just student loan debt forgiveness in the case of income payment or income-driven repayment or the public service loan forgiveness program or even debt cancellation, which we will get back to, I promise, all of our listeners out there. It's also about lowering the cost of college to begin with. It's just like the rent too damn high. Right. So what are we going to do about that? I mean, one of the critiques of student loan debt cancellation is that there's no real plan for, you know, we might solve it for this generation of borrowers, but what about future generations of borrowers? And frankly, I think that's a fair critique. So I don't, don't kill me, but I do think it's a fair critique. What are we going to do about the future and making sure that this is not a problem that just keeps repaying itself? Mm-hmm. Ashley, that's to you, my friend. Oh, dang, it is? Okay. Um, absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I think, you know, even as an advocate, we've always said, absolutely, we have to do something about affordability and accountability yeah. and, equality, and quality in higher education. We have to make it more accessible and affordable for more people so that no matter what happens to the 44 million right now and this 1.7 trillion we have outstanding, no matter when we do something about that or how we do something about that, we don't wanna end up here again. We don't wanna keep creating generations of borrowers with unsustainable debt. We don't want that pressure on our communities, on our families, on our economy, we can do better. And so, you know, it starts with investing in higher education, that free community college, including our HBCUs and MSIs, you know, in having more investment at the state level. Part of the reason why tuition continues to go up and the cost on families continues to go up is because many states um, disinvested in higher education and haven't put that money back post Great Recession. We have to think about that. We have to encourage people to um, think about all the different pathways to college, to apply for aid. We're, we're really encouraging people to fill out the FAFSA, right? You might be eligible for grant aid you don't even know about. You might not have to take out those loans, right? And then when you do have to take out loans, making it actually so that you can manage repayment. We want to make repayment simpler and easier to navigate and so that your student loans don't become a life sentence that follow you all the way to the grave. And those are all things that we are looking at and that we have proposed. 
but we need our state partners to, to work with us on this because they also have to invest. And it also is about accountability. We need to hold our loan services accountable. We need to hold our institutions accountable because they are getting a lot of money, a lot of investment. And if we want higher ed to, to continue to be that public good that it's supposed to be, that requires the investment and oversight of the public and of our um, government entities. Absolutely. And, you know, as we, you know, go into this, I think it's important to remind everyone, I think the congressman mentioned it earlier and the congresswoman mentioned it, we invested in Pell grants, right? And an increase in those. Ashley, can you just remind everyone what we did on, on, on the Pell program? We just had the largest increase in Pell that I forget. Yeah has it been uh, since we had that large of an increase in Pell? That's that's major. I mean, you know, the Biden Harris administration has proposed going even further and raising it more, but that is a that huge increase. What was it? Five hundred dollars, and it's going to go up to even more. Um, is a big deal, um, and we still know that there's more to do. And there's more we want to do, um, but we need our partners um, at every level to work with us on that. Well, we are so thank you so much, Ashley and Michelle. We are so thrilled to be joined by the president of our guild, Bobby Scott, the National Urban Leagues, Bobby Scott, as well as the National Urban Leagues, Shalandon Hollingshed, who has become a good friend. She is the president of our young professionals. And I will tell you, the young professionals have listed student loan uh, as one of their top priorities for obvious reasons. And I will tell you, as we have done different briefings, um, through, from the Washington Bureau for the Urban League movement, guilders also, right? People under 40 with the young professionals, people <clears throat> over 40 uh, for, for the guilders, uh, all care about student loan debt management, forgiveness, cancellation, all the things. And, and as we prepare to kick it to them, because they're going to run some questions uh, that we're getting online, I want to acknowledge this. We look at all of the different uh, plans for student loan debt cancellation, whether it's the rumored 10,000 or the, the rumored 50,000 or whatever. Well, our goal of the Urban League is to ensure that African Americans definitely benefit from that. And as Congresswoman Presley says, as we give more money that will help more borrowers of color because we disproportionately owe more money. Um, so we don't want to have come at the end of this and everyone who has their loans forgiven don't look like the people on this screen and many of the people in the audience. That's not, that would not be fair. But we also know there are those who feel like it's not quite fair to forgive loans for borrowers when, with tax, you know, when there are people uh, who uh, didn't go to college, right? Who are out there who don't carry this debt. So we'll unpack all of that, I'm sure, during our Q&A period, Shalandon and Bobby. I am ready to answer questions alongside Michelle and Ashley from your constituencies and from our public, as well as the Urban League's emerging leaders. Shalandon and Bobby, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Joy. So good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Shalandon Hollingshed, president of the National Urban League Young Professionals. Definitely wanna take a moment to just say thank you to our panelists again for sharing your insight on this topic that has impacted so many people across the country. Now, during this session, our team has actually been collecting questions from our viewers. Many of these viewers are students, some of them are recent graduates, and some of them are young professionals, but all of them are, are wrestling with this issue of student loan debt, and many of them are having to make some very tough decisions. And so we've collected some of these questions, and to kick us off, I'm going to turn it over to our National Urban League Guild President, President Bobby Scott, for the first question. President Scott? Well, thank you very much, Shalanda. First of all, I I want to give some uh, salutations. Uh, Ms. Cheney, you did quite well in cleaning, up, cl cleaning it up. I am the Bobby Scott, okay? Uh, uh, next, I would like to say thank you all very much. I'll, although the YPs do have this as a number one uh, challenge, I want to say that the National Council of, of Urban League Guilds, we, we too have this challenge. Why? Because we're in a position of where is that we're paying our children's loans. So I, I do want to make sure that this here uh, problem goes across all spectrums of the economic uh, um, realm. With that being said, I have the privilege of uh, 
asking the, the uh, first question. So this is the question we have to start with because of so many people are asking. Now, this question is for all the panelists. So after all of this, do you think going to college and taking our loans up, taking out loans is worth it? Heck yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, yes, absolutely it's worth it. I mean, I wouldn't trade anything for it. If I have to take the loans out again, I would. However, I also say that that shouldn't be the only mechanism for folks to um, attend college, especially those of us in the middle class or lower class. We have to find solutions to make it easier. Here in Seattle, uh, we have Seattle's Promise that um, makes junior college free um, for uh, those that attend Seattle public schools. And it's a start, right, to help lower the cost of student loans. But um, yes, I would do it again, but I hope that my godchildren and, and children I may have someday don't have to go into this to, to get a higher education. But do I think it's worth it? Um, yes, but do I hope that we have other avenues to make college affordable for um, our young people and those coming after them? Absolutely. I have a follow-up question to that. Now, we're speaking about college, but how about trade schools where you get loans and also um, uh, for-profit schools? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think higher education, post-secondary education is still worth it. Um, we know that on average, it adds I think a million dollars over the lifetime of someone to to their um, to their income to how much they're able to make. Um, we know that that's still different. There's still racial dis disparities in that, but still, it's in in general, it increases the amount of money you're able to make. Um, I think that it also, um, you know, since the Great Recession, the vast majority of jobs have gone to people with some form of post secondary education. So we can't get around this the world we built around post-secondary and higher education. Now, does it mean that everyone has to go to four years or to get a master's? It shouldn't mean that. And it also doesn't mean that everyone should have to have loans to go to school. It still means that we have to do something about affordability so that we can maximize the return on investment, not just for the people who are going to school, but for the community, right? We think of higher education as a public good because when people get more education, they're supposed to be able to put that back into their community, into their society, into the economy, and then we all benefit from that. And so if people are unable to do that because the loans have make it, have make it impossible for them to do so, then we haven't, we haven't fully realized that value and that return on everybody's investment, every single piece of that. Um, so I think all absolutely it's, it's worth it, but that just means we still have more to do to fix our systems. And definitely like everyone's path isn't through four year, a four year college. Some people's path is through a two year school. Some people's path is through a trade school. Some people's path is, is whatever. What we are concerned about is that every single person, especially the people who have been marginalized for too long, have access to affordable, high quality education and the one that they wanna go to, right? We're about people having access to what, to the type of future and life that they want to pursue and not being shuttled one way or the other and not being preyed upon by predatory institutions. That's not access. Thank you very much. Um, our second question, I would like for um, Shalanda to go ahead and ask the second question, please. Awesome, thank you, uh, Bobby. And thank you guys for that answer. I'm happy to hear that after all the years that I've spent in college that we still see that it's worth it. So thank you so much for that response. Uh, this next question is coming from Jasmine. And Jasmine says, is it fair to measure someone's ability to pay their loans by their income? My income is above some of the limits listed, but I have family members who depend on my support. Is there a more fair way to apply cancellation? You know, th this is Joy, I'd love to jump in there. That has been one of the primary drivers for there not being an income cap on repayment or rather on forgiveness or cancellation. Um, and look, we don't know what ultimate um, policy or program will win out, right? That will be a political discussion um, so that it is something that, that there can be widespread agreement on. On the other hand, there are those who feel like, look, we have to prioritize people who are on the lower income spectrum, right? Because it's most damaging to them. And if you do hit certain amounts, we feel that you will be able to pay off over time. One of the things that you know the Urban League has been thinking about is there some kind of sliding scale, right? That we can that we can do. 
But one of the critiques of any kind of income um, threshold or, uh, or, or um, you know, it, any, anything like that is that the administration of having to check everyone's income is actually quite cumbersome. And when you look at who actually owes the loans and how much they earn, that frankly, you know, it, for the bank for our buck, right? We don't wanna pay in order to have these kinds of, of checkpoints. It might be better to just give everyone a flat amount uh, towards their loan and not worry about how much they make. For the point that I believe Jasmine uh, said, for communities of color, even if you earn more than than you know than than the average, uh, which does happen, I think what Ayanna Presley said is true. Income isn't wealth. Mm -hmm. Income isn't wealth, and many of us have been denied generational wealth for you know gender and racist ish, uh, uh, all the things that we've talked about throughout the last two days, right? So we are suffering from a lack of generational investment and wealth. And therefore, the amount that we're making oftentimes has to go towards family members, oftentimes has to go towards um, amassing savings that other people are gifted um, and bequested through through their generational wealth. If, you know, if your parents, if you are a first generation homeowner, that means that no one had a home to pass to you that you could use, therefore, for a down payment or other, other types of things. Michelle gave a story that was fantastic um, that her, her parents were able to give that to her, but that is not always the case uh, for, our, for communities of color. Sometimes we're a generation away from being able to do that. So income is important, it's not the whole story. And so when we're looking at policy solutions, we have to take into the account the fact that a community of color, a person of color might look like they make a lot of money, but in reality, uh, that's not the same thing as generational wealth. Our next question is from JJ. And, this, and again, this question is for all panelists. Who is at fault when we look at the student debt crisis? Is it, is it um, institutions, the government, or borrowers? You know what? I'm going to rescue everyone by answering that question. <laughs> and then I want to hear from Michelle. But I do. Look, there's no fault. We didn't ask, you know, completely who was at fault when we forgave banks and other people, uh, uh, you know, a decade ago um, prior to the Great Recession. We knew that everyone had a role to play in the ballooning um, housing uh, subprime mortgage crisis. Right. The truth is we um, have, for all the reasons that Ashley said earlier, have allowed really unchecked the cost of college to go up. And even though many of us were setting off alarm bells, concerned about for-profit institutions, which the administration was able to really do some great work uh, last week in forgiving the debt of those who attended predatory institutions like those that that were um, owned by Corinthian. Um, but also we know that even in, in you know, schools that are doing the right thing, cost is just, the, the costs have gone up too high. Um, and we also, I think, have to be careful about how we tell people that they should go to the school that's the highest on the US News and World Report ranking. Um, that's not always a good choice, right? Our obsession with, is my school number one or number three or number seven or number 15 or number 50 or number 100 is not how you should be picking a school. You do have to factor in what your major is gonna be how much money you are likely to yield back and what you can pay, right? And what you're willing to pay. We do have to ask that. There are many institutions where you can get a great college education. So no one's at fault. We never ask that. It's all about what the solutions need to be for our nation. Michelle, I'll kick it to you. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I'll also add, nobody asks who's at fault when rich folks go file for bank bankruptcy, right? And that's forgiven. Nobody asks when other folks, when we, make accommodations for other types of support. I mean, we all have a role to play, certainly like Joy said, but why do we always 
blame the poor for being poor? <laughs> you know, why do we always blame the 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 folks that don't have or can't um, uh, make a way for for their situation? It's not always their fault. So I think, um, you know, there's there's enough blame to go around, but I think we also have to make sure that more than where we are right now, how do we prevent this from going happening in the future? I mean, I think about when I was in school, my tuition was something like $8,000 a semester. I went to a private black college, I get it, but now it's more than twice that now. Like I would not be able to afford to go to that school right now. And I make decent money. My children would not, I would not be able to afford to send my children to that school without debt. And while I do agree that um, folks uh, should not go to schools that they necessarily can't, that are out of their realm of possibility, I don't want to stop somebody from dreaming either. You know, like why, why should my children not be able to go to the school that I attended to because it has become so expensive. Like we have to make some serious, serious changes to make sure that all of our children have access to a quality education on fair terms. Awesome, I love that. And I think that's a great segue into the next question as we talk about prevention and then also looking at something um, that I think we talked about a little bit earlier in terms of private loans. So this question actually comes from Chris. And Chris says, how do we break the cycle? Even if student loans forgiveness happens and what is preventing the whole thing from restarting with the next class of college students? What help is offered for those who signed up for student debt relief outside of the company. Its origin was still a student loan, but predator companies have come in to save the day. Um, yeah, I think that's that's definitely part of what, what, we're think, what we're thinking about, what we're all talking about is, you know, we do have to do something about the cost of college. We do need to do something to have, have a free community, a debt-free college option. Um, you know, the Biden administration has proposed pre, free community college, w would love to make that happen, investing in Pell Grants, investing in our HBCUs and other MSIs, all of that needs to happen. Um, we definitely don't want to end up here again, right? We want to fix the system, but make it so that it works better going forward for every single incoming class and for the next generations. Um, for, you know, there are a lot of scams going on right now. And, you know, the unfortunate byproduct of all of the conversation around what we do about student debt, which, you know, is very exciting and great. And it's great that people are thinking about student loan borrowers and recognizing how big of a crisis it is. It does mean that it's opened it up for scammers and, you know, scammers going to scam, right? And they are looking for people to scam on a scam. I get those calls, those texts all the time. Um, and so it, it really sucks. And we know that some people have, have had to deal with that. We have government agencies that are working to do something about scams. We're working with folks like the FTC, the CFPB, everyone to hold those scammers accountable and to provide relief and to shut them down. So when you feel like when you hear about these companies, please send them our way, go to our website, submit a complaint, submit a complaint to the CFPB and the FTC so we can shut them down. Um, and always just remember that for federal student loans, you never have to pay for help. You never have to pay for help. You can get that automatically through your servicer and through our call centers. You never have to pay for help. You're paying interest. You never have to pay for help, right? <laughs> um, and that we are never going to ask you for your PII. We're not going to call you and say, give us a, your social security number. We're not going to call you and say, give us your sign-in for studentaid.gov. You can call, if you call us, we might ask you for that, but we're not going to call you and ask you for that. We may send you messages and tell you, you know, look out for these programs, do something like this, but we are not going to reach out to you and require you to give us information. So that's how you know you might be getting scammed. So be on the lookout for that, submit complaints, flag when things like that happen and know that you don't have to pay for help and that you, if someone is asking for your information, that's a scam. All right, thank you so much. Can I jump in and ask Ashley, Shalondon? To sure. give a number that she should that people should call if they need help or the website again. Yep. You should call 1-800-433-3243. 1-800-433-3243. And if you have an issue, you want to submit a complaint, you can also go to studentaid.gov slash feedback. We have a really great ombudsman right now who is working hard to deal with all of these issues and to, and to make sure that we are elevating complaints and issues. So studentaid.gov slash feedback. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Singleton. Why do they have the right to give your loan away? Why can they sell the loan to another finance company? Why can or should the government do to ensure the student loan service providers cannot implement aggressive 
abusive collection tactics and practices to protect student loan borrowers? So for federal student loans, um, for federal direct loans, they're not, no one can um, give your loan away. Your loan is held by the federal government. You may see your servicer change. And so that may be what happened. And that could be for a number of reasons. One, if you sign up for PSLF, for so long, you went to Fed Loan Servicing, you went to FIA. Later on, because FIA is leaving, you're going to go to Mohila. So part of it is that there are services that are leaving the market. So depending on what program you're in or things like that, you may get assigned. We have recently redone all our contracts to um, for servicers that include way more consumer protections and borrower protections so that servicers are going to be more held accountable for the, for the level of service that they are providing and the outcomes that they're providing for their borrowers. And so we think that we're going to see better outcomes and we're also working on a long term servicing solution so that borrowers will be able to manage will manage more of it in house. Um, so we're working on that, but so they're not necessarily um, selling your loan, but you may see your servicer change and that could happen for various reasons. But what we are working on is making sure that every single servicer who works in our system has a has strong accountability measures and that borrowers will then know what to expect and they will get high quality customer service every single time. That's what we expect. Um, uh, my boss, the federal student aid chief, Rich Cordray, came in with that being his mission, that we were going to have high quality servicing for every single borrower. Thank you. Shalanda? Awesome. So we have time for one more question, and this question is for all the panelists. Are graduate loans being considered for forgiveness? And can we talk about the difference, if any, with regards to equity when it comes to cancellation of undergraduate loans versus graduate loans? Ashley, I think that's you. Yeah, Ashley. <laughs> I, I think you know so much of so much of what's going to happen with cancellation is still being discussed between um, the Secretary of Education and the White House and you know DOJ and figuring out what they can do and, and who they can do it for. So so much is still being determined. But I think for folks who have thoughts and opinions and concerns, uh, you know, advocacy is in my heart. You can advocate, you can put that opinion out there, you can tell your story, you can work with Joy and with Michelle and make sure that you're, they're, they've been advocating for things for a very long time and I know they will continue to do so. We want to hear that. We hear from folks all the time. So continue to make your voice and concerns heard. Jolanda, can I jump in and just say maybe we could throw it to Michelle because she might have an opinion about whether or not we should be forgiving grad loans as well as undergraduate loans. I say law, that is that. You know, once that, that is uh, compiled and is there, um, I, I do think, however, um, you know, maybe there's a possibility that um, they can be weighed differently. I don't know that uh, an undergraduate degree or some sort of trade um, um, certification is uh, an option now for most jobs um, uh, of today. So, you know, if, if there is a possibility, actually, you know, Maybe there's um, more uh, a pathway for that to happen sooner than later, because sometimes that um, that master's degree or doctor's degree may may be a choice to elevate your experience and your expertise in a field. But um, that is that, you know. And we need and and I'll say to that to that point also, we need our doctors, we need our black doctors, we need our black lawyers. And, and so why should that, again, be a preventative measure for them to, to attain that higher education? We need them. And so if, if we can offer a little assistance and a little help to get them there, I'm all for it. But I'm, I, I live for the collective we. My friend, um, a dear friend of mine says that, um, you know, we Black folks in particular, um, we live in community. When, when I got it, we all got it, right? When I hurt, we all hurt. And right now our community is hurting and we have to do something about it. And I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, and I would just say, I think that's great, Michelle. And I would just say that when you look at who holds some of that graduate de debt, um, black women are some of the most educated people in the world, not just this country, but certainly in this country. And they have gotten those graduate degrees. So when you talk about who will be disproportionately harmed if we lop off, uh, one pot, it might not, you know, it might look uh, like the people that, you know, you are seeking to help. And so we want to make sure, and, and those are the folks who predominantly help their entire families and their entire communities, um, both in whatever work they're doing, but also financially. 
So we want to tool them and enable them uh, to be able to give back. And if, you know, debt cancellation for them needs to be a consideration, even if we consider, you know, scale and, and, uh, and, and some details, it is important to consider graduate debt. Absolutely. And as an individual who has graduate school loan debt, I agree with you wholeheartedly <laughs> um, that we've got to do something to include them as well. All right. So first, I just want to say thank you again to our panelists um, uh, uh, for sharing your words of wisdom. Um, special thanks to our viewers for your provocative questions. Uh, we're going to conclude our session. But before we do close out the session and wrap up the conference, it is my privilege to welcome back our NUL president and CEO, Mark H. Morial. Thank you. What a great legislative policy conference. Thank you for being a part. Thanks to all the members of Congress and each and every one of the members of the Biden administration who took time to share their insights with us over the last two days. Now, let me share this with you. When we created this legislative policy conference way back almost 20 years ago, our call to action was that if we were out of sight, we were out of mind. And the idea was to bring the power and the force of the Urban League movement and to civil rights, to Capitol Hill and to Washington DC on a consistent basis to speak about the issues of policy, to bring the grassroots and the streets to the mighty suites of Washington DC to bring the pain, the suffering, the hopes and aspirations of black people to the corridors of power in Washington, DC. And to do it consistently and to do it with friends and to do it with force and to do it with intelligence and to do it with a plan. This year has been no different. We remain in a fight for the soul of the nation. Democracy remains under siege, but I'm confident that together with hard work, with determination, with passion, with a commitment to equity on the shoulders of our ancestors, with our force and power, with the strength of our allies and friends, we will make a difference in the future of the nation and improve the quality of life of the people we represent. This legislative policy conference is a building block I'm hopeful to see each of you again very soon in Washington, D.C., when the National Urban League convenes in person for the first time, first time, first time in three years for the National Urban League Annual Conference, July 20th through the 23rd. NUL.org is where all the details are. You and I both need to be in this fight every single day to work to empower communities and change lives towards an equitable future. We're gonna work together to erase racial disparities in income, health, education, and criminal justice. We're gonna work with an agenda which is thought out, intelligent, forceful, and passionate. And we're gonna work together, together. Now we got a few things on the horizon. The US Supreme Court's imminent ruling on Roe v. Wade could be catastrophic for women's health, but also set a dangerous legal precedent for restricting the rights of all Americas. These are challenging times, but together, together we must stand to fight forward for an America where the playing field is level for everyone. In the words of Shirley Chisholm, Chisholm, we're unbought and we're unbossed. And let us work together. Stay empowered, keep the faith, and spread it generously. Until next time, I'm Mark Morial. Thank you, Mark. So if you can believe it, this concludes our 19th annual Legislative Policy Conference. The National Urban League has successfully delivered our message and our charge for change to Capitol Hill, the White House, and all policymakers. I want to thank all participants and all speakers and everyone who joined us online. 
Thank you again to all of our sponsors, beginning with 2022 presenting sponsor, Johnson & Johnson, and our supporting sponsors, Anti-Defamation League, Comcast, DoorDash, Lyft, National Grid, T-Mobile, Viasat, Verizon, Walmart, and Wells Fargo. On behalf of the National Urban League, we appreciate your passion and look forward to seeing everyone next year, hopefully in person. But look, one more thing, I have to thank everyone who made this conference possible. This includes our producing team at Noelle Elaine, Backhand Productions, Untuck, the National Urban League staff, especially the Washington Bureau and the marketing and communications team and the IT team as well. Thank you so much. Before we go, let's remember that although we have a lot to fight for, and we've talked about it this week, we also have so much to celebrate. If you missed this yesterday, please stay a moment for an encore presentation of the National Urban League's tribute to the newest confirmed justice to the United States Supreme Court, Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson. Bye. Our nation's highest court will soon have a new voice. Nominated by President Joe Biden, alongside Vice President Kamala Harris, and confirmed by the United States Senate, Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson will be the first African-American woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. It's been a long journey to this historic moment for Judge Jackson and for our country. Starting with the Supreme Court's inaugural session more than 230 years ago, we have had 115 justices. Only five have been women, only two have been black men, and only one has been a woman of color. We have never had a black woman confirmed to the Supreme Court until now. For more than two centuries, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence has been decided without the perspective of black women. Even those decisions that denied their rights, diminished their humanity, and created obstacles to Black women's advancement. With this absence, the vision that guided our High Court and our nation from its inception was blurred, and our nation's quest to achieve a more perfect union was compromised. But today is a new era for the Court and for America. Judge Jackson's historic confirmation marks the arrival of an exemplary legal mind one of the most tested, experienced, and qualified jurists ever chosen to serve the federal judiciary. Judge Jackson graduated magnum cum laude from Harvard University, graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School, served as a supervising editor of the Harvard Law Review, clerked with Associate Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, who she will replace on the court, will be the first sitting Supreme Court Justice since Thurgood Marshall to have served as a criminal defense attorney on behalf of poor defendants, was an assistant special counsel and vice chair of the United States Sentencing Commission, where she worked effectively to reduce racial and income disparities in prison sentencing, served eight years as a federal district court judge, served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, arguably the nation's second most important court. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson will be a voice of knowledge and experience of empathy and fairness on the nation's highest court. Her voice is one that speaks from a place of broadened understanding of how the law impacts all Americans. And it is a voice that will prove especially critical in the months ahead as the court considers legal questions related to voting rights and access, women's choice, religious liberties, affirmative action, and police misconduct. In Judge Jackson's own words, I decide cases from a neutral posture. I evaluate the, the facts and I interpret and apply the law to the facts of the case before me without fear or favor, consistent with my judicial oath. I do so now 
while bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Thank you, Judge Jackson, for your exemplary service and dedication to fairness in our judicial system. And congratulations on your confirmation to our nation's highest court. There's a new voice on the Supreme Court. A, a nation, nation is, is listening. listening. The National Urban League would like to congratulate the spring 2021 graduates of its Congressional Advocacy Program. These leaders successfully completed a six-month intensive certification program designed to expand their knowledge of congressional and grassroots advocacy and its application within the Urban League movement and beyond. Representing the National Urban League Young Professionals, we would like to congratulate Megan Benz, D'Angelo Blanchard, Kristen Bryant, Karen Burks, Kelly Doucette, Bayless Fidman, Nicole Hamm, Alicia Johnson, Christopher Johnson, Tara Martinez, Christopher Smitherman, Jamila White, Ashley Williams, and Henry Wynn. Representing the National Council of Urban League Guilds, we'd like to congratulate Doretha Jones.